You can now follow me on all my social media platforms to find out who my latest guest will be. And don't forget to click the subscribe button and the notifications button so you're notified for when my next podcast goes live. All of a sudden, he's pulled a fucking gun on him. I thought to myself, this is a bad fucking idea, you know what I mean? So he's looked at him, called as a cucumber. Gone, all right, okay. He's walked downstairs, gone, right? He's gone missing for 10 minutes, yeah? Well, everyone's flaring upstairs. He's come back, him and another member of the doorman. He took two guns, put one in his head there, one in the other guy's chest. The other doorman's got a gun in his head, and he's got this yardie with a gun there. So you've got four guns now, all pointing at each other, right? And you've got us in the middle of this. And thinking, what the fuck? In Colombia, cocaine was $600 a kilo. Okay, by the time it crossed in Jamaica, you could buy cocaine in Jamaica for about three thousand US dollars a kilo, and uh, you know, so it was a, still a, a strong uh, profit mark on that. You know, and obviously not as much obviously as places like Guyana where there are low land borders and stuff like that. And because of Jamaica's uh, proximity to the Miami, it was obviously slightly dearer. I guess. All right, so. Before putting myself back in prison, I'd say alleged. Okay, I'd say alleged. Um, in the region, say two thousand kilos a month of um, of cocaine, allegedly, and in terms of cannabis, perhaps maybe fourteen thousand pounds. That's uh, seven and a half ki- um, seven and a half ton. Here we had something which no everyone wants to have, where the whole team of customs officers at the docks, and how that looks is basically a team of how how it works is a whole team of unit. They basically control the docks. They're called fast team, threat anti smuggling. So any container that comes with a wolf, they have to examine it, technically speaking, but they've got complete control over it. Now, for a million quid, they'll clear whatever you want, which in the big scheme of things isn't a lot of money, really, because you can load it with whatever you want. Boom, we're on. Today's guest, we've got Andrew Pritchard. How are you, brother? I'm really well, James. Thanks for coming on today. It's a pleasure. I've seen your documentaries, Andrew. Read your books. You started the rave scene. People up to 10,000 at that. Made your first million at 22. You coconut, eh, cocaine and coconuts, 500 kilo worth of cocaine you were involved in. You're just out of prison again, just last year. Fascinating story, Andrew. Very fascinating. Well, yeah, it's been a journey. Um... But I think before we start the interview, something's really important I've got to put out there is that any young person who listens to this today, the last thing I want them to do is think that this is a road to go on because it can, you know, at parts seem quite glamorous, but it will end up bad. It will end up, you know, destroying your life and other people's lives. But, you know, it's a journey and everyone goes on that journey, James, so... Yeah, it's a roller coaster, <laughs> just what it yeah. says. Eh? You've got to you kind know. of get your seatbelt on, and yeah. you're trying to make the changes now, which is a great thing. But mm. I always go back to the start with my guest brother, where you grew up and how it all began. Yeah, so to get my story, um, I think you have to go back a little bit further before I was born, um, because the fabric I became, the person I became, was a result of obviously who my parents were. And um, my mother, she's Jamaican. She came over to England when she was 22 years old. Um, in 1951, December. That was three years after when Empire Wind Rush, which was the first generation of West Indians coming here. She was married in Jamaica and uh, she came here to be with her husband. That was an abusive relationship. He used to beat her quite badly. Um, but she was very, a very spirited person, very ambitious person. She wanted to help her people. Um, she was one of the first um, Jamaican rural homeowners, you know. Um, here in England, the reason being one day she was they'd rented a house in Stanford Hill, had some friends there. Uh, they went to the, the uh, market to buy some water coconuts. They were breaking them open on the doorsteps. The Irish, uh, sorry, the uh, Jewish landlord passed by. He saw what was going on and evicted everybody that night. So her ambition was to not ever have a roof over her head that she didn't own herself. So. By 1954, she bought her first house, which was on Homedale Terrace, and that was done quite ingeniously. She had a pardoner system, 
for those who don't know what pardon system is, it's a bank, basically, whereas you have lots of people who are working, who you have to trust, they have to trust you. You look after that person's money every week, you take a contribution, and it revolves around where someone gets that pardon draw. And this was the first um, deposit for most West Indian houses, cars, businesses, that kind of thing. So she used that instrument to put herself on the property ladder. She left um, her, her husband and met my dad. Met my dad in 1954. Um, my dad, he was East End boy. And him and his brother used to have a paraffin business. He used to sell paraffin door to door. Um, West Indian people come in here at that time, first generation. He had a friend guy called Billy Hill. And uh, him and his wife said he wanted to get a club. My dad knew they would never be able to get a um, license. And he decided to be the director of that club for them. And they opened the first West Indian club, um, contrary to what anyone else thinks and stuff, because there's sayings that there were places in the West End, like the Roaring Twenties, they weren't the first. It was the Pepper Pot, 60 Green Lanes, Haringey. And that was it. And uh, met my mum, and that was it. They, they hit it off straight away. In 1961, they bought their first property. And in 1966, I was born. So, you know, I grew up. My parents are good, strong people, had very good, fast, strong values. My mum and my dad, dad was a bricklayer, uh, master builder by this time, besides for doing the paraffin. Um, and they're very ambitious. My mum used to have a boutique in the bottom of the house. She used to buy what they call cabbage dresses. Cabbage dresses are um, when the catalogues put them out to the factory, there's usually a certain amount of cloth left over. And what the um, factory owners would do is they'd produce runoff additional dresses so she'd buy the dresses from them and uh, sell them from the basement of the house to women who were coming to the Ridley Road market down the road on Saturday so I grew up around business I saw you know this is what they'd done you know and when I got to a you know certain age you know I'd go and build this like my dad my dad was a bricklayer so I'd labour for him and I got familiarised with kind of the understanding of work understanding the making of money and I was a decent child actually you know I was very taught to toe the line um wasn't until I got to secondary school that things started to take a little bit of a dip for me I went to a school called Philip Magnus which is quite a notorious school um I'd say many um very well-known crime figures had went through that school um but um, I think Terry went through there and um I think Patsy Adams went through there as well um, and yeah, quite a few other people from other families and stuff that have been quite known, you know, I've, I've talked about in press and stuff like that. But um, yeah, that was Philip Magnus. The other one was William Collins. If you didn't go to Magnus, you went to Collins and those schools used to fight. And uh, you had a right sort of tranche of people coming out of there. So then I started to mess about, smoke, do all kinds of other bad stuff. My parents wanted to get me out of the area. A um, little bit too late for that. So they moved to Chinkford. And uh, wanted to send me to school up in Edmonton. But of course, that didn't work very well. By this time, I had a love for music. And uh, I started building speaker boxes. I was putting on little events, which were like uh, what they call blues parties. And um, I was actually making money. This was a young age. This was like, you know, 15, 16 years old. And I hence didn't go to school. So I bunked off every single day. And I spent, you know, time, you know, with my friends, building speaker boxes, you know, planning like what were small events, blues parties. And then started getting involved in silly things, selling bits of marijuana, stuff like that. And it just sort of continued. Um, and I just started to find myself in that pattern, driven by the element of music. But where it sort of really lifted up and changed was... Um, my parents bought a shop in Hackney, which is a very, um, it was an off license, but it was more of a community base, you know, people would come now. No person could ever say they had, didn't have, you know, a, a meal. In other words, if someone had no money, my mum would make sure they got a dozen eggs and a loaf of bread, do you know, and a pint of milk. Worst case, the rest, they were feeding their kids regardless, you know. And um, I was there, and their aspirations was for me to be this legitimate businessman that would, um, you know, have a string of off licenses, no doubt. But that wasn't going to happen. I remember one day, I think it was like 1988, by this time I was already quite, kind of pretty much out there. A friend came into the shop, said he was putting on a party, and uh, wanted to know if I'd do the sound system. Said, not a problem. And uh, I turned up, a little place called Oxford House in Bethnal Green, with my, you know, equipment, set it all up 
and that was the day my life changed. Um, it was the advent of ecstasy, and the party kicked off to about 200 people in there. They were all, you know, sweating, you know, buzzing, and it was a mad thing to see, considered I didn't take Class A drugs at that time. I smoked weed, you know, and uh, it was a completely new atmosphere for me. That led to another party the following week, party after that, party after that. And um, at that time, I was involved as a, um, you know, providing the sound system and stuff. Wasn't even actually playing now. But, you know, eventually I saw the money that could be made. And I thought, this is something I want to do. It wasn't unnew to me because I'd been doing blues parties where we would break into houses and set up speakers and set up an illegal makeshift bar. Um, it was in my blood to do that. And um, the next step was warehouses. And December um, 1988, that was when Genesis was born. How old were you? Um, I was 20. So still on a young kid. But yeah. You got that business yep. mentality from your mum and dad. I'd seen it, you know. Everything I'd seen with my parents, I said, mum used to actually encourage me to count money. So when people would buy dresses, stuff like that, she would actually, you know, give me the money to count because she knew why. And she said, if I've got familiarising money from a young age, you know, it's like seven years old now, you know, she always felt that I would understand, you know, how it was to have money and not be, you know, overly, you know, green towards it, you know. And she was right. It did help me a lot. So what was it like then when you started Genesis, when people... 10,000, some say there's parties up to like 10,000 people, everybody loving life, full ecstasy, MDMA, just what was the main objective again? Was it to get ticket sales and then flood it with drugs? Or was, what was, did you have everything, like a business module? Or was it just to cause a rave, make money? Did you realise how big it would be also? Well, the thing with um, Genesis, and this was what was quite mad about it, the parties before then were relatively quite small scale. Um, so when we set up Genesis... Um, it had originally been done because we were actually generally interested in the scene. So we were, you know, attached to that scene. It was a great buzz. The atmosphere was brilliant. And obviously the money was, a, you know, a, a something which, which also you know, drew us in. And the concept was to put on big events. It didn't start off originally to, you know, to turn into what it became. Um, that just naturally, you know, it, as things kind of started to, you know, step up and get bigger and bigger and bigger, it grew organically. And um, the party started off, and where we found was a place called Leaside Road, which was quite a um, journey. It's in Hackney, old Springboks factory, and um, we went by there one afternoon. One of our partners, he'd found it and said, look, this warehouse, you know, it's like a um, guy's got it in there, he stores tyres, and we can get it. It's completely legal, 500 quid. We saw the warehouse, thought this is a great spot. Um, we put on our first event now. And it was a small party, but it went well. Interestingly enough, the second day we were in the warehouse, a guy walks through the door. The guy walks through the door, I recognised him because I was involved in that scene. As I said, you know, doing other parties, supplying equipment. A fellow was called Tony Coston Hater. Anyway, Tony basically is very well-spoken English kid, you know, um, public school background. He marched into the warehouse, said, this is a great sort of warehouse you've got here, and want to do events with you. So it was a question of, well, you know, we've, we were doing our own thing. He said, yeah, but, you know, I've, I've got Sunrise, you know, and Sunrise is like, we can get like, he was getting like seven, 800 people at the time, not big events, but they were growing, and he had a good crowd. It was like, okay, well, we can do this. Let's put it on together. So we scheduled an event. Um, we put it on, I think it was Boxing Day of 1988. Anyway, we staged the event. Um, it, I think we had about five, 600 people there. It wasn't a bad event. But the beauty we had was the venue, the warehouse. It was huge. Just opened that layer after layer after layer. Anyway, we went again the following um, week. We hit a party there. Suddenly the crowds were coming up. We got, I think it was about three and a half thousand. We then landed on New Year's Eve. So New Year's Eve now we'd anticipated what's this going to look like, you know. The word was going around. Suddenly now people were starting to hear about Genesis. A lot of people in the West then now were starting to come down. And it was like we could, we could sense it was going to be huge anyway. Never forget we were setting up New Year's Eve. We had everything all in place. It's fucking all of a sudden fucking police turns up 
They said, like, you know, um, what are you doing in this warehouse? I said, listen, it's completely legal. We've got this warehouse. We had a makeshift lease as well, which, of course, was not worth the paper it was written on. But he basically went back and said, right, I'm coming for the, going to bring the fire inspector down. I thought, fuck. Where we had the party the night before, we had all these black bags full of, you know, tins of soft drinks, beer, all kinds of crap. So we got the doorman to quickly get them, throw them out the back door, literally blocking the, you know, any sort of um, alleyway there was. All of a sudden, Cosby comes back with the fire inspector. He then turns up. He literally looks at the exit, puts his head around the door, doesn't look properly. He seems pissed off like the Cosby has dragged him from his, his party. And he's gone, nah, it's fine, let them have their party. Well, that was it. We um, got about 5,500 people in there New Year's Eve. And then we went again the following week, thinking it's gonna, it was going to get less instead of it got more. And we topped out about 8,000 people first week of January. And of course, that was insane because we were in a stage we were closing down the West End because people were no longer interested in going to clubs in the West End, buying overpriced drinks and getting kicked out, you know, one, two in the morning. They were now deterring and coming straight to us. I remember that um, night we had Mini Vanelli, who were the biggest um, act at that time, you know, uh, Pet Shop Boys, Boy George. Boy George, never forget, we had to literally pick him up, scrape him up from the floor. <laughs> he, was in a, he was in a bad state, mm. I tell you, you know. And, uh, you know, it was, it, was, it was a crazy thing. Being so young, as I said, and seeing what was going on was pretty insane, you know. It was all around us. We were just, we were the centre point of everything. How many people were working in your team at that point? Uh, in, staff and well, staff In included. our team at that point, at that point, we were relatively still not completely organised as we should have been. So I remember we had 10 casual doormen. We had a little team, an encircle team, that come and clean up the warehouses, you know, who were mainly friends. So I suppose it's about 20 people consisted of our little unit. Tony was doing the parties with us. He had about 10 people as well. So we had a little round group of maybe about 30 people, you know, working How did for you us. know how to trust? Because it was all cash in hand. There was well, no cameras back then. Well, that was the big thing and a fucking hilarious story actually about that. And uh, it came out like years and years later. We used to have a count room. And so what we'd do is look at the warehouse. We'd find a most suitable place. And what we'd do is when the money was coming through the doors, it wouldn't be counted thrown into black bags. The black bags been took through the crowd, put into the count room. You're counting it anyway. Most maddest story. You thought, okay, fucking amazing night there. So places packed with people. Wayne was sitting in there. We've got the mobile phone. Mobile phones are brand new at that time, so that was a trick we used. So we used to have a meeting point originally before we could send them straight to the warehouse, and then we'd have the big old brick mobile phone, and then we'd have someone on a moped waiting at the meeting spot where all the cars would be. We'd uh, he'd have a pager. We'd phone him, send him a thing, say right. He'd go to the phone box. He'd then say, "This is where the warehouse is." He'd jump on a moped, and all the cars would follow in a convoy. Because we knew if we got them to follow in a convoy, if the police did turn up, what happened is they'd be at the back of the convoy. So by the time the people spilt into the event, they wouldn't be able to control it. So they'd have to wait till the following morning till everyone emptied out. And then by then we'd skip, so we wouldn't get nicked in the you know in the uh, in the aftermath. But um, the story with the who to trust and not to trust, I never forget. So years later, I heard a story. One of the Tony was notorious. Uh, you know, he used to be a professional gambler basically. So he was banned from all the casinos because he could count cards. So he was a guy that was very, very clever, very you know on point, but couldn't trust as far as you could throw. And I'll say that to him now. He knows. But um, apparently what he'd done one night, and I couldn't believe this, he told Wayne afterwards that he was actually left in the count room with Keith. Keith wasn't interested. He wanted to go off and buzz somewhere in a warehouse. So he's looked around the warehouse for thought, where can I nick money? And he's a little hole in the roof. So apparently he was getting money and stuffing it up through the hole. And the next morning now, all right, and remember it's open warehouse, he said he's gone back, gone upstairs, and all he saw was a mountain of money above on the, on, the, on the second floor the warehouse so who you can trust is one of those things but at the time as i said you know it's you know you're young people and you're doing it and your mind is more concentrated on the event you know and you're suckered into that so that was how the party started to grow and then things started to change you know as we started to make money we had to be more vigilant and you know it's a lot of money coming through the door how much 
we were, we, we were taking that lee side road at that time with the bars we were taking the drinks and the gate so we were probably taking 60 70 thousand pounds now that was a good little snatch do you know what i mean going through the gate you know and considering five as tenors do you know what i mean it was two quid for a, a tin of coke so the profit margin of that was we were probably laying out maybe insecurity and sand not even seven grand do you know what i mean so the fucking the profit margin was insane but as we now started to become a more more sophisticated, we increased the price of the admission. And obviously, there were a lot of people going on doing stuff at that time, armed robbers, particularly around the Canning Town area, who were, you know, looking at parties as a really, really easy target. So we had to look differently. So Wayne, uh, his stepdad used to work at a club called His Stairs. And uh, he had a little group of guys who worked on the door with him. And uh, he said, look we better step up the security we you know really need to put a, a, a firm door in place so he brought on some guys um one of them you've interviewed colton lynch carlton yeah, started there Colton, so colton yeah so colton so colton was part of the firm and uh we got 12 guys basically but these 12 guys were very icf i see dominantly icf yeah you know uh, they were very handy do you know what i mean and they were up for it as well and uh they became our door and of course they tagged themselves as a g-force uh, which came back to bite us in the ass, but we'll get to that. Anyway, um, so basically, yeah, they were our door. They became known as the strongest door, generally speaking, out there. And we started to do party after party after party. Leaside Road came on top because we found out that the property wasn't owned by the fellow who we got it from. He actually was squatting in now. So when they turfed us out, we were on this roller coaster ride of finding a new warehouse every week but luckily enough uh keith was our main warehouse hunter he used to travel up and down in the week he'd be looking for empty derelict warehouses he'd spot one he'd go back with a crowbar jimmy the door stick a different padlock on it and then we'd wait until the saturday afternoon to go in there kid it out and set it up you know so how did nobody know, how did people know back then, because there was no social media, that there was going to be a rave then? Flyers. We used to have hand, that simple as that? hand-built flyers, mm-hmm. um, James. So we'd go and print like four or five, four, five thousand hand-built flyers. We'd have a little team of people, you know, um, some really good looking little girls and stuff. They'd go outside the clubs, there was Spectrum, there was Future, there were a few clubs which were dominantly known for that scene. And they'd wait till people would even give them flyers. And got to the stage everyone knew Genesis is the party to go to so people would be waiting for the Genesis flyer where's the Genesis flyer where's the flyer two meetings points were put on the flyer mm-hmm. Rave's been busted Damn, the <laughs> how the hell is that guy that's weird that's weird that's alright okay we'll jump back on that <laughs> <laughs> okay, we'll catch back on that. Um, so yeah, so it was all down to flyers. Mm-hmm. We used to print the flyers. Had a little group of girls who would go out, giving out the flyers after you know when the events ended in the West End, and that would be it. We'd have two meeting spots put on the flyer, and people would turn up at the meeting spots, and then we'd bring the convoys from the meeting spot to the venue. You know, it was no social media, and it was advanced. It's weird because now the officer that was in charge a guy called ken tappenden of closing the parties dan you know he publicly stated in a documentary that what we'd done back then the army couldn't even move people around like that and the police certainly couldn't do it at the time so it was quite ingenious but it must have been for the police and the authorities they were pulling their hair out you know because they had no control over what we were doing um we grew and we grew and we grew and then inevitable stuff happened our door grew also and um in a nice way our security wanted part of of the business which was fair enough because we gave them 25 percent um between 12 men to me that was fair they were putting their life on the line and also they were there and they were a strong firm you know they were the kind of guys that if you had a problem and you said it's a problem they would do whatever had to be done to get rid of the problem do you know what i mean so that was a powerful move, you know, and um, they become very well known as a, as a strong door firm. I'll never forget one specific incident, and it was a classic. I was reminded about it not so long ago. We'd done an event at a place called The Gallery up in Bow, and uh, I'm not going to say you know, particular people's names because I haven't spoken to them, probably wouldn't mind, but, you know, one of our doormen, um, let's put it like a very, very fertile guy, he'd explode at a drop of a pin. 
Um, it was a question of some of the parties. You'd be wondering, fuck, as is, is, is he going to beat a braver to de death and throw him somewhere in the warehouse to be found? You know what I mean? Little thing could kick him off, right? So we went to the event. I forget, we've got this guy's got this, got this warehouse. So we're talking to them upstairs and stuff. One of them's getting a bit sort of trumped up a little bit with him. All of a sudden, he's pulled a fucking gun on him. I thought to myself, this is a bad fucking idea. You know what I mean? So he's looked at him, called as a cucumber. Gone, all right, okay. He's walked downstairs, gone, right? He's gone missing for 10 minutes, yeah? Well, everyone's flaring upstairs. He's come back, him and another member of the doorman. He took two guns, put one in his head there, one in the other guy's chest. The other doorman's got a gun in his head, and he's got this yardie with a gun there. So you've got four guns now, all pointing at each other, right? And you've got us in the middle of this. And thinking, what the fuck? One false move out, and it's a, it is a bloodbath. Do you know what I mean? Guns go left, right, and centre. But that was what was to be expected. The scene started to get more and more and more explosive. And uh, as the word got round, do you know, that they're up for confrontations, the police got word of that as well. And then also it became a go it for drugs because the parties were massive, they were growing and they were growing. And people realised pretty soon that if you could get into a Genesis party, you know, you could sell abundances of ecstasy, abundances of drugs, and make hundreds of thousands of pounds every given night. So that was inevitable that Genesis was going to be one of those events what was going to be earmarked for people to sell drugs. But it wasn't just anyone was coming to sell drugs. We were obviously, you know, very connected our door were to the football firm, ICF, and they were East London, you know, guys, all local. So if anyone was going to be having stuff selling in there, they were going to be people who were local to us. Did people try to muscle in, though, when it started popping off, if you're making over 200 grand a night? Well, the maddest thing was the door that we'd put in place, our security firm, were strong enough to face anyone. So what threats we would have had, because we would have had loads of threats coming to us, no one really wanted to come over and fuck around with them, you know? And what they were starting to do now was they were starting to go and to other events and take over their doors in a nice way. So we had our doorman now fucking doing all the security for all the warehouse parties. But of course, the word was now going around, it was a protection racket and this stuff and that stuff. And they then would tag themselves as a G-Force and the police's eyes, the G-Force's genesis. So it then put myself, Wayne and Keith as their targets, not the doorman. But suddenly we were the ones, Genesis were going around, taking over the whole of the scene. So that was a necessary problem which was created, but we had it and we had, just had, we had to live with it. But then, of course, jealousy started to come into it and it became a series of raids. So it was a question of every fucking week we were getting raided before we started the event. So there was information coming out internally from some you know, one connected to our organisation that was giving us up, basically, you know. And we had a series of raids, series of raids, series of raids, and that just continued to happen and happen and happen until it basically brought Genesis to its knees, you know. And uh, Tony, at that time, we severed partnership with Tony. Tony then went on to do some huge events and stuff, you know. And he had got a lot of publicity from, the you know, Sky News. And, of course, the banger was the um, the, the, the one he'd done in an aircraft hangar where the Sun newspaper, the Sun newspaper at that time, I mean, fuck knows how many people read it, four or five million people probably. And, you know, that part it was on the front page of the Sun newspaper. i never forget it title spaced out you know and when i saw that newspaper that morning i thought this is fucking it man this is the end of it margaret thatcher then kicked into gear you know she put out literally a price on everyone's head you know shopper promoter was the campaign and it just started to it became what was a scene which was pretty much fun how long did it last for um the warehouse scene actually went from 1988, something like that, to 1991. We didn't have a great run. We'd had a, like, we had out of it a year, you know, as I said. And then people like Tony, he got a little bit longer of a run. Then the music changed slightly and, you know, you had other organisations coming in. And then the licences started to come into play, you know, Ministry of Sound opened. And then the scene sort of fazzled out and moved away from what it really was, the street kind of thing, into a more of a commercial a business and entity. Um, ahead of that, in 1991, um, by that time now, 
or ahead of that time, I had a network. You know, the network I had was on every fucker that, you know, supplied or sold drugs in that scene. And there was a matter of time, basically, before it became logical that if I now moved into that arena, I would be able to have the biggest distribution network of ecstasy if I needed it. So, you know, some people I know had come to me, they were manufacturing and importing lots of ecstasy. They said, look, you've got unbelievable contacts within that network. We haven't, but we've got the products. You know, can we come in and can we, you know, do business? And it was like, okay, so we opened the doors to that. And um, it was people I knew, as I said, you know, would buy huge amounts in wholesale. And we were probably doing like 250,000 pills, you know, a fortnight, which was a huge amount because it was a relatively small scene. What were you getting them for back in the day? We was, well, at that time, pills used to sell for eight pounds wholesale. Yeah, that's about So they used to sell shit, for, yeah. before those doves. And basically used to have um, like... In the parties, I think they said about 15 quid, you know. So there was a big markup for the person who was selling them on. But obviously, you used to work on a pound profit, pound a pill. So if you made 250,000 pills, you know, and you were moving those a fortnight, you were making 125 grand a week. That's serious money. Do you know what I mean? You know, you can't turn your back at that, you know. So that was a great gateway, as I said. And, you know, it supplied a lot of drugs up and down the country you know to a lot of parties a lot of events a lot of raves and like everything uh flew very close to the wind on that one and then one morning i got a phone call said don't go home i was like what don't go home there's police everywhere i was like okay right it's time for a holiday so i kept my you know disappeared under the scene I um, called someone and said, look, I've got to get out of the fucking country, man. It's all over me. So they said, well, look, <laughs> what we could do is a passport. I said, fucking, I've got the passport. I was like, oh, shit. So I said, okay, look, do me a favour. Back then, you used to use one-day passports you could get, you know? So it was like a, you could go in the post office with a picture and they'd give you a passport. It was like, power came to me. He said, listen, I'll get you a one-day passport. What you could do is use my name and use your picture. I said, okay, right. So that was it. I went now. I... Um, Got across to France, I just kept low, stayed in France for, I think I was out there for about a month, four weeks, while I was getting a passport prepared, sent out to me. So I had a passport, I had an ex-girlfriend fly out, she went with a passport, took the passport, um, I'll never forget it, went to the um, <laughs> to the uh, French embassy to get an American visa, because I had people in the States, and uh, they gave me a bloody visa to go to the States. So a week later, I flew down to Miami, um, I kept low, I was in Fort Lauderdale for the best part of three months. And then it was time to go to my next leg of my journey. And uh, that was Jamaica. Because my mum obviously was born in Jamaica. She had a lot of influence, a lot of respect. A lot of people really looked to my parents, you know, because it helped a lot of people. So when I got to Jamaica, I was in a very good, fortunate position. And um, I was able to be around people who were the elite, you know. Of that situation and I was there but I was a friggin wild man you know I was just coming from this craziness in in London and she was trying to they would like to me to be very civilized because I was put around you know family members and people who have you know connected um, you know extended family and they were all in political power basically on the island so they were like okay just keep a low profile you know just duck down and you, you'll be all right you know it won't come here for you. So I, of course, being me, couldn't keep a low profile. So every fucking night I was in a fight or some drama. And considering everyone carries a gun out there, it's not a particularly good idea to start, you know, going and have straight with people. But I was still very, uh, very wild at heart, you know. And um, I met um, through, again, through a family member, a, a, a young lady, and uh, we started seeing each other. And her father was um, a deputy prime minister, so he was heavily positioned in politics. And um, she fell pregnant and had my first son. It was Giovanni. And uh, again, I couldn't keep myself quiet. And I just continued to be the rebellious man I was. And one night, I remember going out, I saw this girl and she was like so fucking stunning. I was like, wow. So I said to my friend who was with me, again, his father was a minister in the government, who the fuck is she? Who's gone, kid, she's like Miss Jamaica. She's fucking, you know, just 
Caribbean Queen and stuff at Miss World. I was like, I, I need to, I've, I've got to see this girl. So I was like, that was on my mind. For your poor Mishka, it was like, it was out the window, you know, all bets were off now. And um, <laughs> I remember I hadn't seen her and then I saw her again at a club we used to go to called Godfathers. It was like something out of a Goodfellas film, you know, so it was like when we went in there, like grabbed the table, they brought the fucking table over to where the, where the dance floor is. That whole kind of bravado, managed to get her to sit down and... Uh, as fate would have it, her and her friend were there. They went up to go to the bathroom and as we're sitting there, because we had bottles of champagne and stuff on the table, two other girls would come and jump straight in their seats. So she's come back out of the bathroom. Two girls are sitting in their seats. Fucking almighty fights kicked off. And uh, that was the beginning of it. She kicked one of the girls, I think, and broke her um, one of the bones in her feet. And that was not saying, obviously, you, Miss Jamaica was supposed to be seen doing. But, of course, the root of the problem was me. And uh, myself and Erica, you know, we got together. And as I said, that was something where, as you know, we had a really strong bond. And I thought, it, moving from Kingston now, because I was in the heart of Kingston, I'd moved to Ocherius, which is by the coast. So we bought a place. And ironically, as mad as I can see, because this time I'm still, don't know if I'm wanted by the authorities in England, so I'm supposed to technically still be in a low profile. I'm not exactly low profile now because I'm in the newspapers of being with Miss Jamaica and all that stuff's going on. And then I've moved to a place and then to find that Vivian Blake would also live in now. And Vivian Blake was the guy that had created the Shower Posse, which is one of the most notorious um, gangs in Jamaica, him and a guy called um, Jim Brown, you know. So Vivian, he was wanted to be extradited to um, America. Jim Brown had uh, been, well supposedly burnt to death in his prison cell while waiting to be extradited in 92. And Vivian was, you know, keeping a low profile in our as were several other notorious people. And they seemed to all buy places in the same complex that I'd bought a place, you know. So I was more or less in the belly of the beast. Um, and then what did I do next? I wanted to make money, so I started to import cars and of course I realised I could circumvent the customs um, duties down now and that was basically used to pay 240% to import a car that was a duty you'd have to pay on it foreign car so I'd realised after speaking to someone who worked at the wharf I could do bits and pieces like bring the clock up put some old tyres on it do some little tricks and stuff and what they would do is they'd be able to seriously undervalue the cars for me so I was in a position I'd Getting friends send me up cars, I would then, you know, do what I had to do to them, make ten, fifteen thousand pound a car, which is a lot of money back then, you know, and that was a good business. So it was legal and not so legal. So I was, you know, it wasn't extremely bad, but it was bad enough. But it was making good money, you know. And then um I went from there and as I said, uh, I got a good network of people who I sold cars to. Of course I was selling nice cars, BMWs, Mercedes. And the people who buy those cars are politicians and drug dealers. So, you know, I had a circle around me now, you know. And I then went to get involved in uh, opening up a moped business for tourists, stuff like that. So I trusted a friend. He was sending some mopeds up. One occasion, he decided to increase the profit. So he put a couple of Nick mopeds in with the, um, in with the parcel. And, of course, um, that went badly wrong. Customs down here you know, discovered it, and then it brought the heat to where I was. So that was now another unsettling situation. So I would inadvertently brought it to myself when I should have just been doing, you know, legal business. Um, Erica wasn't a part of any of that. She didn't want to be a part of any of that, you know. What I've done, I always do, and I don't tell my women about because I believe that's how you do this thing, you know. And the pressure of everything was getting too much for our relationship, and uh, we we split, you know, and then... How was that for you? How was it that was very you? hard. It was weird because at the end Do of the day... You, it was, chose, you, you chose the money over your missus? Yeah, and that is the, 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 the sad thing about it, you know. It's it was greed. a question of greed, you know. And in my mind, it was a question of, you know, um, doesn't matter. What's the big deal? I'm making money, I'm going to keep taking money. And this is where my mind's at, you know. This is what I'm going to be doing. And consequence was my wife and my child do you know what I mean and it was like 
you think about it and it's insane, you know, that your mind is so wrapped up in, you're stuck into this scenario of it's all about greed, it's all about money, it's all about gain. And that was it. And I guess at that point um, was really when I started to, you know, step into a different, um, you know, diff different level. And then it wasn't long before I'd realised the contacts I know how at the Wolf clearing um, cars and motorbikes were incredibly good contacts to have to ship out other products, you know. So I came back down to England by this time the heat had cooled off and I started now to, you know, link up back up with some of my older circle who had all um, matured and developed in their own elements of business, you know. And a lot of those guys now had stepped up the crime ladder and they'd chosen, obviously, to get involved in narcotics business, which was a sort of no-brainer. And it made complete sense at that time to be able to source products in Jamaica, which wasn't hard for me to do. Um, so I'll never forget, actually, I went down there to um, arrange something once, and um, I did say, obviously, we need to transfer the money from, obviously, British sterling to US dollars. That's how the trade works. And... Again, I had incredible support of um, extended family, you know. It was a real combination of completely straight people to the real, you know, heavyweight criminals. And one person in particular, I'd went to see him, you know. And he left. He lived here in the 70s. He went back to Jamaica and um, became incredibly powerful. He was a smuggler. Um, he had great roots. He used to uh, smuggle a lot of cannabis at the time from Colombia, uh, Colombian gold into the States. And also he used to smuggle stuff back here. But as I said, he was a very well-respected smuggler, had a great network and also ran an illegal bank. So what it was, foreign currency was a very hard thing to obtain in Jamaica because obviously they had a, a tight hold on it. Um, Jamaica doesn't produce cars or things like that. So people, when they want motor vehicles or they want luxury fridges or whatever they want or goods for their business, they have to pay in US dollars. Having a network of the main smugglers, he meant he could buy currency from them, convert them into Jamaican dollars, and he could then do business between that world and this world. See what I mean? And uh, he kind of said to me, not a problem, but what are you doing, Andrew? And I was like, I'm doing this. And he was like, you're going to get yourself killed. This is Jamaica, you know, and you're talking about running around doing this if you're going to do this he said not that i want it for you but he said i'm going to school you i'm going to take you under my wing that was a huge thing because this guy was one of the most powerful smugglers in the whole of the caribbean and he'd retired effectively you know he'd smuggled heavily in the 70s um as i said out of columbia he had a series of boats um when the trade went from um cannabis to cocaine that's when he left it and he, uh, as I said, just just gave it up, basically, you know. But his understudies, they were guys who basically were happy to take the contacts in Colombia. And they obviously started to get heavily involved with the cartels and smuggling the cocaine. I think in 1990s, I think 20% of the, all the cocaine in Colombia had actually was transshipped from Jamaica. So if you get an idea of what you're talking, you're talking about not just Medellin cartel or the Cali cartel, you're talking about every drop of cocaine, 20%. You're talking about hundreds of tons of product passing through Jamaica. I remember people buying fishing vessels because, not to catch fish, but they would go out because on the sea because they'd have these like little man-built um, submarines they'd build in Colombia, load them with coke and try to get them through, or go, go fast boats from off of the tip of um, Honduras into St. Elizabeth. But of course, when the DEA put up a helicopter or whatever, they'd throw all the stuff off. Or if the submarine would, you know, take two to, to the water, they'd float up. So you'd have hundreds, you know, some of the thousands of keys of coke just literally floating in that, part of sea so you know people that had boats would go out literally just looking for cocaine floating do you know what I mean people and were watching this now fucking getting boats <laughs> 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 how much was it for a Kia Coke in Jamaica back then back then okay so back then you in, in Colombia cocaine was $600 a kilo okay by the time it crossed in Jamaica you could buy cocaine in Jamaica for about $3,000 a kilo 
And, uh, you know, so it was a, still a, a strong uh, profit mark on that, you know. And obviously not as much, obviously, as places like Guyana, where there are low land borders and stuff like that. And because of Jamaica's uh, proximity to the Miami, it was obviously slightly dearer. But um, as I said, it was in abundance, you know. So it, it was the home, really, of cocaine, which was the home of marijuana prior to that, you know. And uh, I had contacts, as I said. I had people at the wharf that I knew could easily, you know, send products if I needed to send products. It was a question of having people here who could then, That's you know, it. receive it and distribute it, yeah. So there were lots of people here who'd worked in the markets, you know, and perishable goods every single day were travelling, you know. They can't get stopped, really, you know, otherwise they'll go they'll go rotten. That's the idea of perishable goods. So we've got companies bringing in bananas and mangoes and yams and everything you could possibly imagine. Uh, there's a whole cycle, a whole potential of products just coming through day in, day out, day in, day out. So it was really good for me because I could sit in Jamaica, you know, at a nice, safe distance. You know, people could be here. And it was a question of just keeping things flowing, you know. And that was something which was which came really, really natural to do. And it was fun because it was like fucking fun. It was a question of a great life. And you were actually separated by one and you were dealing with people in Jamaica you could trust, you know, who were real people of serious power, you know. What happened here was a different story, you know. You got what you had to get down here. You just got to take care of that side of the business and it's in their lap, you know. And, um, yeah, that was the journey. How much were you getting shipped over each week? I guess, all right, so... Before putting myself back in prison, I'd say alleged, oh. okay? I'd say alleged. Um, in the region, I'd say 2,000 kilos a month of um, of cocaine, allegedly. And in terms of cannabis, perhaps maybe 14,000 pounds. That's uh, seven and a half kilos. Um, Seven and a half ton, yeah. Of uh, yeah. So of proper cannabis. shipments getting sent. Yeah, over. proper shipments. Yeah, of course. Yeah. How much you were know? you making? See, before you went, done the weight, the coke. Yeah. How much were you worth then? Um, that's a really hard question. To you ask comfortable? Because or you know I think mean? it's a yeah. I think it's a question. It's hard to ask because, again, you know, looking at PII documents and things like that when um when I was finally arrested because. Public interest immunity documents are what the police, the DEA and the different agencies, you know, say they've got, you know. And uh, mad figures were put in there, insane figures. In 2006, um, a ridiculous figure was put in a newspaper in the Sunday um, People Rich List that had 100 million pounds, which was insane figure, insane figure, you know. But... You know, big figures of brands as a brand, but I was making a lot of money, you know, just to put it in any any term, you know, by anyone's standard. Um, yeah, and that was it, you what know. What was it when, like, if Shipman's gets stole, or Shipman gets busted? Because you see in the films, you read in the books, that like, say there's 10 Shipments a month, mm -hmm. people give up maybe two, take those mm -hmm. two, maybe a ton of coke in it, let us away with the five or the 10. Does that happen? See, the game, the, the, the real game is played bigger than that. James okay so the real game is played that people when people put huge amounts of drugs on boats okay or in containers they're not it's not a guessing game okay customs officers police are paid at both ends to make sure that it gets through okay so that's a sealed guarantee if it falls, it's fallen by a complete accident. It's full because something has happened and something, a mishap on a computer or whatever, or another team of officers have been looking at someone, basically, and they've led a different intelligence-led operation and then they've come across it or fell across it. But huge shipments like that are closed, what they call door-to-door, -door, okay? So that's how that works. So the idea of having to give away a shipment here to trick a shipment and all that, if it's playing the game on a big level, you know, you're almost guaranteed at both ends. What you're going to send is going to leave and what you're going to, you know, send is going to be received. Yeah. So every shipment that's going out, they're getting their pay. How, that's how the big game is yeah. played, you know. 
it's not a question of chance. You do have chance, don't get me wrong. You can have a, a door where you can bring stuff through and, you know, it's a company that's been running for a long time and, you know, you can throw 10 boxes on 12 boxes, fill them with boxes of product, do you know what I mean? And you can load them up. You've got 100 key there, 200 key there, whatever. And, you know, someone might discover it, customers might discover it, it might get dropped here, it might drop there. And those are looked at as, you know, just, you can, if you get, you can afford to lose eight, eight out of 10, do you know what I mean? And still make profit on two, you know? But when people are doing huge amounts of product, you know, those are secured. Those aren't just thrown on willy-nilly. They're not, it's not a, um, it's not a question of chance, you know? Yeah, too much at stake for that. 20, 30, 40 million pounds worth. Too much at stake yeah. for that, you know? And that's, that's practical mm -hmm. odds, you know? So, yeah, so that's how that game is played, you know? 1999, um, it was a game that I didn't want to sort of really play much more. Um, so I wanted to get back in the music industry. And as a child, as a young person, shall I say, I used to um, love the idea of uh, urban music festivals. There was only one which was worth doing, and that was Reggae Sunsplash, you know. And um, again, I had a, a member of extended family that was actually connected to that event. So in 90, I think it was 1998, um, we tried to do a festival here, which didn't happen. Um, and... It was a, that was a dance festival, and I thought, I want to go and I want to do Sunsplash. I want to, I want to do this. I want to bring this back to London, you know. So I went down to Jamaica and um, had a meeting, and I spoke to him and said, look, we really want to put this event together and bring it back to England because they'd had it here before. That was um, in, I think it was 1987. They had an event at Crystal Palace Football Grand. They had it the following year, and then the year after, they went to Clapham Common. It was huge. Over 100,000 people turned up to Clapham Common, you know. It was the biggest event, a festival in Britain that year. And um, it got closed down because it was just too much for the police to handle. You know, it was dominantly Afro-Caribbean people. The police had a you know big problem with that. And every excuse in the book was used to close it down for it not to happen again. So bringing it back was a really big thing it was a it was a massive thing to do so i thought here we go so they agreed they formulated the original team that was used at sunsplash and i had to then bring all the old guard out of the woodwork so started off with a um, weird thing in the world a guy called john burroughs obe this guy was director of capital radio and i think his brother was head of the um, um regional crime squad in the midlands and I was like, there I was, do you know what I mean? Ducking and diving and running around. Now I was going to be springing to the table some of the most respectable people in the country to put this festival on. So that was the journey we went on, do you know what I mean, and stuff. And uh, along that, that road, it was, it, was, it, was, it was colourful, let's put it like that, you know. Oh, meetings. Well, it was a question of meetings with the police because you're sitting down with the police and, and the fire brigade and, you know, all the necessary authorities because you're going to put a licence on James. So it's not an under, underground rave where it's just a free-for-all, this is more planned, talking illegal. To, you're going illegal into stuff. the Queen's Park. It's yeah. a Queen's Park and bringing 50,000 people in now. And as bad luck would have it, we had two bad fates of luck. The first bad fate of luck was... A war had been started. It was a spate of shootings, you know, and they were classified as black-on-black -black yardy gangland shootings. It was 13 shootings in told in a short spat of time. So the police was like, there's no way this is going to be a bloodbath, right? And it was like, look, it won't be a bloodbath for the simple reason this is a family event. There's three generations coming out. There's going to be grandparents, there's going to be parents, there's going to be children, right? And there's one thing in our culture we don't do. You don't cross in front of your grandparents, right? And they were like, that's nonsense. These guys are ruthless. They don't care. It's not going to work. I said, no, it is going to work, right? We understand our culture. And this, there won't be incidents like you think there's incidents. So anyway, we've had loads of meetings, community meetings. Mum was very influential with it. And we met a lot of senior people who were in the community, you know, Holston, Brixton, all from different sides. said, look, it can't happen. Not there it can't. Because if it happens, it's the end of something which is a great legacy. I mean, Bob Marley played on this event. Stevie Wonder played on this event. You know, it meant a lot to our culture and to our people, you know? So we'd convinced the police the event would go along. We got a license of 50,000 people. Then we had a guy called a nail bomber that was going around, putting nail bombs everywhere, aiming at ethnic communities. So now, not only have we gone through the whole spate of black-on-black -black shootings, now we had a lunatic which is walking around planting bombs. 
So he thought, this is a prime target. Anyway, it was back to panic stations. Anyone who wanted to be involved was getting very, very shaky about the event. Thank God he got arrested prior to the event. They caught him. So the event went ahead. That was it. The event pushed forward. We had an amazing event at Victoria Park without incident. And the, the ground was laid, you know, it was laid. This would have now been there to compete with Glastonbury. We were stepping it in and that would have been the end of it, you know. And that would have been me hanging my boots up and saying, right, I'm on this road. Mm -hmm. But, as they say, the road to hell is paved with good intentions. Because <laughs> you know, I've just retired in Jamaica. Yeah, many times. <laughs> Many times. So many what happened times. then after So that? what happened now, um, after that incident, basically, the, we were, the festival, you know, was off, the grand, we were in position, we were in place. And someone uh, came to me and said, look, um, they've got something, right, basically, and, uh, you know, would I mind sort of, you know, um, making sure that it's all right. I said, it's not a problem and stuff anyway. They were involved in cars, we were involved in cars at the time. It was quite funny, really. And uh, what they did was they were getting cars in from Europe. And the cars were kind of ringers. And uh, what they'd do is they'd basically break them down and ship them elsewhere. So how it actually came about was, and this is the most funniest thing in the world, he came to me with a, I forget what it was, it was a top of the range of Mercedes. And uh, he said to me, look, you know, um, you know, what do you think of these? They're so beautiful cars. In fact, what we'd done was, we had Wyclef Jean come over for the um, for the festival to play at the festival. He was actually driving him around in one of them. So we had Wyclef driving around in a ringer. If he'd been stopped by the police, I'd love to see the headlines <laughs> on that one, right? Anyway, uh, one of the cars was sitting on my drive. Uh, one morning, I got a, a knock at the door. Bam, serious crime squad come through the door. We're investigating stolen motor vehicles, and that was it. They've been watching the office. They've been watching the comings and the goings. They've been onto that little network of people who are ringing cars, and it then came straight to me. Uh, that was it. Okay, so arrested unceremoniously, taken to the police station, and now I've got a ringing case on me. Anyway, the police had come down. I think I was from Southampton because that's where the cars were shipped from. Anyway, during this window now, um, they had me on bail. So when I sat on bail, it was a question of waiting for the next court appearance, waiting anyway. During that gap, I was really got released from bail. And it was like, I'm released from bail. I've got a passport. It's fucking cold here. It's miserable here. Jamaica, here I come. Again? Again. So there I was, black on a flight, back back home in Jamaica. And of course, needless to say, didn't take long. The sun splash thing obviously now had, was out the window. You know, that couldn't happen, especially not given the circumstances. There's no fucking way the police would give me a license, do you know what I mean? So I just went back to what I know. And that was a journey. It was a question of same old, same old people coming down on a regular basis, talking to me facilitating things you know and just constantly having the door open you know back and forth back and forth back and forth um and that journey happened until in 2000 and um i think it was 2000 and yeah 2002 i came back so i came back um which was an unwise thing to do really thinking about it was know? there any heat on you from the british coppers over in jamaica if you were yeah, shutting but stuff here. Everything was being blocked because I the position I sat in was a very, very fortunate one. So I had a great political circle um around me. So anything in terms of intelligence that was coming up from Britain, and that was coming multiple intelligence. It was there's Metro, there was DEA, there was Customs and Excise, and there was regular uh, Met Police, which was I think um regional crime at the time you know so anything they were coming up with intelligence i'd get the heads up immediately it was like okay right they've got this pi has come we have to share it how pi works i'll actually show you what it looks like how it works is intelligence is formed different agencies then they've got certain agencies they have to share it with so when they then share it with jamaican intelligence straight away hey presto I've got access to it. So I think, fuck, right, okay. So they're on me, I can't go there, I can't, I can't go there. And you just play that game, moving the 
moving a penny around the board, which was what I'd done incredibly well. So that was how I managed to keep myself basically always one step ahead. Anyway, I came back down here and the skies. I had more fucking passports than the passport office. Why did you keep coming back? Because it's just, it's the constant... Buzz, you know, what, greed, just change? It's, it, 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 you miss it, you know, as mad as it is, you know, you miss it. And you, you know, your parents is a great figure as well. When your parents are alive, yeah. you've got a family. Coming from a family, you mm-hmm. want to do it. And the stories with a fucking passport, I'll never forget one day, it was absolutely a madness. I've got a passport to come back from down there to go back up there. And um, I've arrived, we've arrived, and I've booked into a hotel down in Jamaica and... Fucking, I've given the woman the passport, the desk. I'm sitting down now, talking, and she's calling out this name, Mr. Dominic, Mr. Dominic, Mr. Dominic. I completely ignore what it's Mr. Dominic <laughs> is. She's getting louder on the tunnel. I said, fuck, oh, fuck, that's the passport. So I ran up to the thing. I said, I'm really, really sorry. I said, I, I, I didn't hear you and all that. She goes, no, Mr. Dominic. She said, oh, the passport so checked me in and all that, right? I shouldn't know it was coming. Because prior to this book, right, this book I've been using, but then a friend of mine down here, the, the picture was coming out a little bit so a friend of mine down there came and said to me look i can get so i can fix that for your hand I take out the page and they'll replace it so anyway paid him got the thing fixed right so i've gone down a bit but i looked at the back page it was slightly off color it was like a more of a lighter purple and the other two i'm thinking fuck that's close to the mark anyway so i've done down in jamaica that was the first call it should have been a warning sign for me anyway when i'm leaving the island now I've got to the um, to the passport desk, and the girl's gone. Um, um, Mr. Dominic said, "Um, I've got a problem with your passport." So I've said, "Oh, what's the problem?" She's gone. Um, did you get it anywhere issued like a different passport? I said, "No, got it from Petit France because I've got to say, go to Petit France." She's gone. There's an issue. It said it's not passing our um, our check. I said, "Well, do a different." She's done. We've done four different checks. She said it's failed every one of them. I'm thinking, fuck, right? So. My pal has gone, what, this is just scoop. I said, no, fuck it, let me persevere. So she's now on the phone to Brit, like British and all that. So she's gone, okay. She said, um, I said, listen, I'm going back today, right? I said, I don't know what you're doing. Passport's good, so I'm blagging it. So she's gone, okay, then. She's gone, um, I've just spoken to British Customs, and they said they'll deal with it at that end. I'm thinking, fuck, right, this is worse now, right? So I'm thinking, do I leave the airport or do I go? So I thought, all right, fuck it, I'm going to go for this. So get put on a plane, we're seated, thinking, okay, now I'm thinking, fuck, there's a seven and a half hour flight, I've got seven and a half hours to think of a story, right, and it's got to be a brilliant one, because when I get outside of that airport, there's going to be an issue, so they were waiting now for the police to come on the plane as we, as we, as, as we land, anyway, I see two police come on the plane, I'm thinking, fuck, there for me, just walk straight past, there's some guy, some poor geezer, he's been obviously deported or wherever, they brought him back, so he's handcuffed, he's walked down the gangway, I'm thinking, my luck can't be that great, so I'm walking down now, James, when I've now got to the uh, passport control, I've seen two people, an old lady and a young guy, now this guy's staring at every single passport, he's looking at them all really, but she's really lackadaisical, so I'm thinking, right, I've got to jump in her queue, I've got to find that way in, so anyway, as I'm trying to move from one to the other to the other, the other, fucking, the guy starts calling me. So I dropped the passport to give myself more time, hoping someone else would walk around me, but he's insisting to call me to the thing. Anyway, I think, fuck, so I walk up there. As soon as he sees the passport, he flicks it back, goes, looks at it like that, goes, you mind sitting over there? Straight away, and the game's up. So I'm sitting down, give me it for 10 minutes. Then he says, oh, would you mind coming out? So he walked me into this room. This is the most maddest place you'd ever see in your life, right? It's in the airport, and it's a holding bay, basically, forever. Now you've got loads of Chinese guys who've got the passport. They throw their passport away when they board a plane, so they've got no identity where they are. You've got a lot of Africans, Jamaicans. You've got every race on earth all in this holding room. But there I am now with this deep Cockney accent. So they're trying to figure out, what the fuck is it? he doing here it doesn't seem right you know but it can't quite put their finger on me so anyway when i'm sitting there now i've already got my brief on what i'm going to say so this fella comes back in he's got a big fucking folder in front of him right anyway he drops the folder on the desk so as soon as he drops the folder on the desk i think to myself right so i take the ball by the horn so i get up at him and i go listen right you know it mr dominic he's like that. 
sort of taken back because that's going to be his big words to take me I said Dobrik I said Mr Dobrik I said looks fucking nothing like me I said let me tell you why I've got that passport and the guy's just like got to hear this one I said listen really good friend of mine so was going out there getting married wanted me to be the best man so in the reality was you know I thought it's horrible it was cold over here do I really want to be sitting in England when my best pal was getting married I said so I thought you know what Let's see if I can get my hands on a passport. I said, and went into the pub. I was talking. Literally, someone came to me and said, listen, I'm over here talking, son. I can get you a book. If you want a book, it's because you're 100 quid, right? No questions asked. I said, listen, I thought the guy was bullshitting. I give him 50 quid. He said, we'll meet me. He came back two days later. There was the book, right? It's like, what's this person's name? I said, I can't fucking ask people's names. He said, so you're telling me you flew on a false passport in a time of height of terror, right, to go to your friend's wedding. As soon as he said that, I thought, this fucking idiot has fell for this story, right? So I said, yeah. I said, what would you do if the balls were in a foot? He said, I certainly wouldn't do nothing like that. Anyway, he's gone in a huff and a puff. He's left. Now I've got two police about an hour later that have come into the polling area so everyone now see these police club everyone's frightened they think they will come for them but i don't have come for me anyway they take me out of there into the police van on the way to the local police station so on my way to the station now I get there so now they're trying to pry me in the van so they're saying to me um so hold on so why would you do something as mad as that why don't you just sign your own passport now i'm thinking I've had all these previous warrants out for me. A lot of times transpired now, right? Fuck it. I'm just going to go for it. I said, well, to be honest with you, my passport would have expired, which had expired anyway by this time, right? I said, and um, it, they told me at Petty France it would take me at least like uh, uh, eight weeks to get one back. My pal was getting married, and I just went for it. So the other guy goes, what's your name? So he's taught my name now, and now I'm expecting to get it fucking, it's going to flash up, it's going to be fucking all kinds of things going on. Anyway... Nothing, no handcuffs, no additional questions, all staying down the line. So I'm like, okay. Um, I said, is it, I'm in serious trouble then, right? So they've gone, you could have been in serious trouble. You go to prison for this. Next thing he's come out with, do you know what a caution is? And I'm thinking, there's no fucking way he's going to give you a caution for this, right? Yeah, you're getting two years for a passport, right, James? So anyway, I said, no, what is a caution? He's got listen, he said, if you get a caution, he said, and you get in trouble again with the police, he said, you break the caution, he said, you'll be in prison. I said, no, you're joking, right? He's got it's serious, I got completely serious. Anyway, they pulled me out the station, right? So I now know I'm in the clear, because I've got no flags up on me, right? Second thing now is, they give me a caution, and released me. So I'm thinking, fuck, they've made a mistake here. They ain't dug far enough. Do you know what I mean? So call this cab, get into this fucking cab. The guy starts off, as he pulls off, the frigging car breaks down like two metres from the police station. His fan belt's gone. So he's on the phone to the AA. They're getting on the big long thing with him and all that. And I'm panicking. I'm looking in the back window thinking, any fucking minute they're going to go, hold on, but you just let that guy go. We want him to question for this and for that and the other. Anyway, so I'm sitting there panicking and then all of a sudden, Finally, AA's come, fixed this guy's fan belt, and I've managed to get back to, to the manor, you know? And I thought to myself, fucking hell, you know, there's a God out there looking out to me. So what, what I do, it just seems that I cannot, cannot get myself nicked. Whatever, I, whatever happens, I always find my way out of it, right? And this is where the full sense of security comes now. So when things like that happen to me in my life, it just excels, James. And all it became was a worse and worse and worse Feel journey. Felt untouchable. Felt untouchable. And of course, no one is untouchable, okay? And the breaking point came, finally, in 2002. Um, and that was a big breaking point because here we had something which no, everyone wants to have. We had a whole team of customs officers at the docks. And how that looks is basically a team of, how, that, how it works is a whole team of unit they basically control the docks. They're called Fast Team, Threat Anti Smuggling. So any container that comes through the wolf, they have to examine it, technically speaking, but they've got complete control over it. Now, for a million quid, they'll clear whatever you want, which in the big scheme of things isn't a lot of money, really, because you can load it with whatever you want, right? So 
the scheme is this container leaves the point country you give them the serial number that means it can't be touched by um coast guard while it's on the water when it gets here it arrives at the dock where the time of night it is they then lift it basically so what i'll do is i'll put it in for an x-ray x-ray is the most primitive thing in the world so an x-ray in this day and age is a lorry comes by it pulls up beside the container something called a boom arm which is an x-ray goes through the front of the back of it to see if anything's in it one guy sits in the back of it with a screen he only takes a photograph if they discover something but hey presto it's loaded but he does, does he just says nothing doesn't he so there's no photograph taken and he clears it right and once you've got that piece of paper that said that's that, that container's cleared Lorry comes, picks it up, takes it off the wolf, and you're gone. That's as simple as that, right? That's the system. What happens if the police stopped after he's left? Is that piece of paper still give him the all clear? No, because once you're on a wolf, the wolf is the wolf. It's a secure area. Mm -hmm. If that lorry driver then gets stopped on route to where he's going, you're fucked. Do you know what I mean? Because at the end of the day, but remember, they're going to have to unload a whole bloody container full yeah. of goods. Do you mm -hmm. know what I mean? It's not an easy task to do. And these containers are still sealed anyway. So the probability of the police stopping it is more than highly unlikely because as far as they're concerned, it's still travelling, you know, in bond effectively. So this was a system we had, best system in the world, until one of my co-defendants, he decided to make himself very busy. And when I say busy, what he was doing basically, he was tatting for work other places. So another team of officers now, a completely different unit, they are on to him and his activity. So when the container is coming now, a container arrives at the wharf, um, it's then marked up that it's been cleared. So then I get a phone call, say it's been cleared. So on the phone, it's cleared. Now they've picked up something's been cleared on the wolf but they're still waiting for something else which is what they think is on the water what they're following him about anyway um pay presto they go down to the wolf and they start looking in containers but they're looking for all the containers what are connected specifically to him anyway um one of the officers who's obviously leading the case he thinks all right this is quite a capable little team so what he they then do is say right let's now check containers that have actually been cleared so of course they then go to the wolf they start to look for containers that have been cleared they break the seal and half a ton of coke falls out on them all right so now what do they do because you've got a whole team of customs officers that say it's been cleared you've got another team of customs officers now that have discovered it so that's a catch-22 because if they suddenly turn around and say well actually you're involved in it, so we're nicking you. It's a case of corruption, and they've, they're in charge of clearing product, which is potentially evidence. So that's never going to stand up in court. There's a billion ways out of that. So they decide they're going to collude together. So they <laughs> collectively now fucking join ranks, and they declare, right, we've discovered biggest shipment of cocaine at that time in the country to get the glory. And of course now we get the signal it's been cleared um, and arrive at the market, arrive at the market and customs then suddenly jump in from everywhere and that's it, unsacrosmonously nicked. Anyway, that's the journey, bang, taken to Wandsworth, six-handed, um, on the fucking news. So by the time I call my solicitor, actually prior to that takes the customs ass, call my solicitor, Poor sod, he comes down, he's gone, um, I've gone, been nicked, he's gone, yeah, I've fucking seen it over the news. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm like, okay, right. He said, right, he said, look, he can't talk in here. He said, this place is bugged to fuck. He said, just don't say a word, right? You're not going to be remanded. He said, I'll come and see you on a visit. We know the routine, the schedule, call down, remand, bang, anyway, sorry, one's worth. Now I'm thinking, fuck, this is tricky situation but how could it have happened do you know what I mean this wasn't supposed to have happened anyway when I get there I'm like comes for the first legal visit I'm like look this thing is as dark as it gets right whole team of customers involved in this right he's like looking there he's like zombie like what the fuck right anyway 
is gone because now disclosures come in and the customs that have been paid off are now actually saying that they've discovered it. It's a great victory for them, right? So these are people we're paying off who are basically nicking us. And I'm thinking, well, fuck, what on earth is there to do? And like, is like you're finished. This is like you're going to get the most severe sentence yeah, you can stretch. imagine here. You can never imagine, right? Anyway, so I'm thinking, this is a dark hole, right? But never give up. There's always got to be a fucking light. Anyway, never underestimate another man's greed. And this is the thing about these documents. PI documents, basically, they're intelligence which are created. And the intelligence that are created, what they do is they come from agencies and they're supposed to be in what these organised crime groups or individuals are up to. So they read a particular bit of intelligence about one of my co-defendants. On it, it says, first one says he's got £9 million in the boot of his car, which I think they said was 900000 in another document, but they're saying it's basically it's broken down into euros and dollar bills, US dollar bills. So now you've got a team of officers, which were at the time customs and excise, um, what they call a, a special, um, special investigation. They became soccer, then they became NCA. So that's a different unit. And... Um, they're looking at these fucking documents and they're saying these guys have got all this fucking money, right? And these guys are on 30 grand a year or 27 grand a year. And when you're putting temptation in the way of people who are trained to catch guys like me because they have to fly really close to the wind. If you were to get me, you've got to think like me and you've got to be out there, okay? Now, that ain't very nice when you're sitting outside in your car in a freezing fucking cold, eating sandwiches, cold coffee, looking at a nice big house, lovely cars, going out for beautiful dinners with your missus. It's depressing, right? So this is the mindset, by the grace of God, that sunk in to the officers who were, tar- who were aimed to target us, right? Anyway, two twos, we're now getting disclosure no sign of disclosure of you know what's in terms of what's really you know be, be, be behind the scenes so they've done a complete cover-up no whiff of corruption nothing like that anyway through my channels right i've got a message to so listen leading investigating officer on the case right he's up for it okay what's the situation got contact with him what's quarter billion quid okay Right, how are we going to trust this? True, how are we going to tr- sand it out that it's for real and it ain't just another fucking drama? Right, we can test it. So, okay, let's fucking try to test. I mean, we're in prison at this time, you know, so we're operating from mobile phone. So, I'm thinking, right, okay, tell you we want to, we want something, you'll get the money, but we want to test if it's real or not. Anyway, sent the message, you've got to send someone um, to a certain place and they're going to give them something and it'll prove that they're who they are. Anyway, send someone, um, person comes back that evening on the phone. What, what was it, what was it? It's a fucking, it's a key. I said, well, it's, a, it's a fucking key, a street door key, and what's this supposed to do? I'm like, what the fuck? Anyway, right, so I'm thinking, what if anyway? So I'm waiting now, call, I've got a call. So look, it's fucking, what's this about? He said, he said to me, that's a street door key for your co-defendant's ass. That's come straight to the evidence, Paul, right? He said, send someone to take that key and try a street door. Thinking, okay, right? Send someone, fucking key opens the street door. He's pulled the key out of the evidence bag. That means he is in the case because only an officer in certain power can get those kind of access to evidence, right? So I said, okay, it's game on. Anyway, agreed to make a payment, which I've done. And the next fucking thing... What we're going to use, what we're going to do, we still, and this is going to get rid of all the cocaine, we've still got a big fucking problem, all right? So, <laughs> something's arranged, right? And um, he takes every single file of intelligence that is on me and all my co defendants and all the cases that are peeled off of us at a customs house to a hotel, photographs the whole fucking lot through the night, yeah? And then puts them back in the safe, paid, and then arrangements are made so I can start to get these papers delivered to me in prison. So I'm fucking hell, so I'm getting stuff come through. 
and I'm looking at this paperwork, man, it's just madness because it's just everything you do. You're watching how these people are following you, right? You're watching how they've got bugs on people's cars. You're looking at informants. They physically got on the case who they're paying, right? And this is just a eye-opener like you could not imagine. But still, it's more dangerous having this stuff because it's just saying... You're up to every fucking thing yeah, that's bad. Go through the roof right. even everything more. that's fucking bad, right? So how do you turn this one from there into an ace? Did any of the informants, did you know any of them? Yeah, several of them. That was the <laughs> most astonishing thing. I mean, we were going and getting meets with people, right, who were involved in smuggling, who were involved in working at the docks, and they were leaving us, right, to the fucking time, and they were going straight to their handlers, getting paid and giving information. I mean, literally, he was reporting from arriving to taking your fucking phone, your chips out of your phone, every fucking detail. And I'm going to show you some of them papers yeah, after sure as well yeah, yeah. to read, <laughs> to really understand how this game's played, right? So see, when you were in Jamaica, you had to pass. If they wanted intelligence, you would have had the heads up. Why the fuck come back? Why come back to put yourself because, through that surveillance, because that intelligence, to gather information, to then build a case against you? Because that's what, this thing does it's addiction James just sometimes better off taking drugs than smuggling drugs the addiction's less because this is what it does to you you get and this is where the criminal lifestyle comes into people you get so obsessed by it okay and you get so drawn into it alright you think you're invincible you think you're untouchable but you're not okay and you're driven by greed you're driven by ego all of those things drive you okay and you're not looking at what you're doing. You're not looking at the fans of life you're destroying. You're not looking at the misery you're causing people. You're not looking at the shame you're bringing down on your people who are good, hardworking, decent people. You're living a life which is a lie, okay? It's all a lie. We live this life, we think it's so great, it's so bravado, and it counts to nothing. That's what it amounts to at the end. No matter how great you come out of it, you're a failure, okay? If I walk into a prison today and deliver a course, first thing I say, Every single one of you in here, including me, is a failure because you're in prison. And that's the beginning of it, and that's the end of it, and that's how it will end up, or dead. Okay? Not two good choices, are they? Yeah. So were you making, when you were in Jamaica, were you making less than instead of being here? Were you, you making more income, or was it just the same? No, it's, it, it balances itself. You do make less, actually, if you're on that side of the water, because yeah. the simple reason is, if you're here, right? Paying top dollar. Of course you are. And also, you're at, the, you're, at, you're, at, you're at the helm. So when you're at the helm of it and stuff, you know, you can't be anything, can come back short or nothing like that. You're in a, you're in a position, basically, you can you know the value of everything. So it's not a question of whatever you send and you're taking. A, you, you always know values of things anyway, but you know the worth. You know straight away, okay, that can be cleared up straight away in a month not the four months that he said it's going to be cleared and then you've got to send another one to him and he's always paying you money which he's always got a deficit of one or two or three million yeah. quid because he's never ever coming up flush do you know what I mean mm -hmm. and that's the game people work off a of debt so people who tend to sit down here who it's not their product they're spending their profit before they've got their profit so when they have someone knock them or something goes wrong the person who's going to take loss is you at the other end mm -hmm. see what I mean yeah. Big scheme of things, it's not hard, hard loss because the profit margins you work on, but it's still wanting to be the be all and the end all. You still want to take every penny. So you're not happy sitting down there. You think, fuck it, I want to get down there because I want to know everything that's going on. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. That's so, a control thing. So, see, when you were doing, like, in Jamaica, was did the intelligence ever come over to Jamaica to do surveillance or were they not allowed? No, they can't because yeah, the problem is they can't travel over there. They got a geezer they put over there called a drug liaison officer. Mm -hmm. Now, with people like that, basically, they're sent out to different um, islands. You have one just sent to every single island. So when they basically come, what they've got to realise is they're fucking, they're coming over to an island that you are in, that you've got everyone that you need, right? Stuff. So straight away, you know, when you're fucking, they, they, cause they give them a house to stay, they give them all these bits and pieces. But listen, the first thing you're on, you know when they're coming, you know where they're about. You've got someone who's, cause they have a helper, looks after their house, okay? They have a gardener. You've got someone on now. So straight a fucking way, they're in that house, every spare minute they got and they're looking to find everything and anything, right? So not only you've got eyes on them 
through the official source, right, you've got eyes on them when they're, f when they're at home, when they're relaxing. Do you know what I mean? Any fucker that comes to see them is a friend or foe, you know, because you're on it. Do you know what I mean? Because this is the person, not just me, or not just a couple of people, but everyone that British intelligence have got an interest in, right, that fucker's responsible. Do you know what I mean? So he's a person you have eyes on all the time, you know? And to be honest, Cha, you know, there are people I know that have approached the liaison officer, you know, on a few occasions, and they've done business with them, do you know what I mean? In order to deliberately send back bad intelligence, bad information. But if you've already got what you need down there, the best thing to do is just have eyes on them because they think yeah. they're doing their fucking job. Anybody can be bought. That's a scary thing in life. Bought, bought so see, when you started looking through your files then and you started thinking so many informants, so much intelligence, but did you ever think beforehand no. that they never had fuck all on you? Never had a fucking clue, you know. <laughs> I, because you think and you walk around and you walk around oblivious and you turn around and you think to yourself, oh, you know, this, you know, they, they can't be on me. They would have nicked me by now. No, they haven't nicked you because they haven't got enough stuff on you. Mm -hmm. They want to get you red-handed. But there's a saying, it's a long time coming. A long time coming is when you're going to get finally nicked and you're going to get sentenced, the judge gets all those PI documents. So when you get a massive sentence, you think, I've done fuck all. What's he giving that for? He's looked in at them PIs and seeing all what you've done and got away with. So he's sentencing you then for stuff that you've got away with 20 years ago. Do you know, and that's how deep this thing really goes, you know. Yeah. But criminals don't know that. So when you were looking through all the files then, did you think, I'm fucked? <laughs> I looked through the files. Could they not have fucking burnt the files? Could they not have got rid of them instead of photocopying no, them? Or because, come on, James, all these, things, in. all these things are generated on computers. Yeah. Okay, right, yeah. so the prints that are printed off, they're file copies. And you're not going to get, because they're shared, so they're shared with the DEA, they're shared with Metro, they're shared, okay? So it's like... What are you going to do with all this fucking paperwork that says you're guilty, right? So the only thing you could do with it is what I sat down and I thought really fucking hard and thought, if I'm not allowed to see this, my barrister can't see it, my lawyer can't see it, the only person who sees these fucking things is the judge, the people that's fucking made it, and the prosecutor leaves the jury. So I thought, this is what I'll do. So anyway, I fucking tailored myself really carefully. <laughs> First day again to give evidence, this is the big finale now, so... I'm in the dock. The fucking prosecutor opens up his case on me now, so he's coming up at me. I give him a pause, right, because I've got my whole script out. I'm going out down the corruption route. I pull out a wad of papers out of my fucking jacket pocket. So now I start to read out things. Not necessarily saying what I was reading out was on them fucking documents, but as far as the jury is concerned... What I was reading out, looking at those documents, must be what's on those documents, okay? So I'm reading these things out. The prosecutor's like, what's it, what's it, what's it, what's it? So I walk from the thing, I start giving papers to the jury, go up to the judge, I toss a thing at him, they say I threw it, but I didn't actually try to put it on his bench, it just got out of my hands. He picks up the water ball, he runs through his chambers, the prison guards oh, grab me to the floor, take me out of court, anyway court break my barrister's like what the fuck what on earth because I can't tell him if I tell him he can't take the case what on earth was that what was all that was that was that I go listen I said they're PIO documents that's what they are where do you get it? like listen he said, I don't even want to know where you got them from he said what what are we going to do now because this has never ever happened in a British court of law ever in history do you know what I mean judge comes back in he's ruffled prosecutor's ruffled they're saying, right, these documents we just found have also been faxed to the court, right? And these documents have been faxed to, faxed to, the, faxed to the chambers, right? So documents are going everywhere now. So he doesn't know what to do. He's you've never had a real, this before, but I know what's going to happen. Jury comes back in. So the jury's back in. The jury's like, first question, what's, what are those documents about? Mr. Pritchard says he's innocent. Um, can we see the documents? So the judge now... He's like, I'm afraid you can't see those documents. So they're like, okay, why can't we see these documents? The judge is, those documents are not for you to see, right? He's got no right talking about his documents or bringing those documents into the court. So the jury, but he said he's innocent. And he says those documents prove he's innocent. So the judge comes out with, if you mention them documents again, you'll be in the holding cells <laughs> with him. <laughs> <laughs> that's the jury uh, right give it that to us so now <laughs> I've got them where I want them so now when the prosecutor comes back at me he throws back Mr Pritchard 
I said, listen, you know the truth, I know the truth. Truth's on those documents. He's like, the judge, get the jury out again. Do you mention them documents? I'm thinking, listen, what the fuck have I got to lose? Mm -hmm. Do you know what I mean? So every time he's coming back in, I'm bringing up the documents. So now, jury, they're frustrated, right? The prosecutor can't go any further because every time I ask him a question, I say to him, you know the truth, it's on the documents, right? Anyway, I frustrate them. So now, up downstairs, right? They can't give me no more questions or answer no more evidence. They're finished. They're stuck in a corner. So my barrister goes to me, right? You know she's found guilty. This is 35 years. I said, if I get 35 years as a result, I thought I'd get 40 with them, right? He's like, well, if you want me to take this final leg now, because it now means he's going to full on go and make an attack in his closing speech that all the customs are corrupt and all this that and the other, really going to take it to the bone anyway. I said, just go for it. So pretty ahead of this, judge calls me up, right? Because I've been attacking the customs constantly. Maddest thing in the world, jury's not in there, asked me to stand up in the dock with six co-defendants, says to my barrister, is it Mr. Pritchard that is making you ask these questions, right? Attack, because remember, barristers aren't supposed to attack, you know, witnesses. Mm -hmm. It doesn't happen. It's, it's, it's not ethical, you know? So he's like, yes, it's Mr. Pritchard. Judge just looks at me. Doesn't say enough, it just looks at me. He said, okay, sit down. Because I know if it goes wrong, I know what I'm getting, right? He's justifying it. Anyway, jury's out, jury's gone. Hour later, comes back in. I'm thinking, whoa, they've got me guilty. Anyway, he's gone, no, boom, boom, boom. Three not guilty. The driver's all gone home straight away, right? I think, fuck, anyway, next thing now, we're out for a day. Day two comes in. Jury comes back, another decision. Bang, another not guilty. One of my co defenders has gone. That's living two of us now, right? Anyway, I'm thinking, we've right, we've got to be home anyway. So we're still sitting on the fence. All of a sudden, um, jury can't make a decision. They, they're hung. They can't come to a verdict. So it's like, right, well, you know, you've had your air for over a week. You're all dismissed to go. So I've got home, never forget it. I've gone home, gone back to, to prison, right, in the prison. It was Christmas, right, the break for Christmas. I was watching the television, and that night I saw the news at 10. And news at 10 had had a whole thing about cocaine, right? They had this whole little program, and you could see that program was for us. It was set, a time space in there, and it was all going to be today the biggest ever drug conviction thing in, in British history. Boom, boom, boom. That would have been it. So instead of that, they had to rush around, get some little street dealer guy with a fucking microphone and a bit of stick to pretend like, you know, this was a segment of how bad cocaine is, you know, um, how heavily involved it is in our society today, right? So I thought, okay, I've missed the bullet on that now. I'm going to sit down, ride this out, got a second trial coming. So anyway, head of the second trial now, thinking this has got to be easier because I can, of course, you know, slide my way through this anyway. So now I'm toying with the whole idea of it. So now, when the trial starts, I'm thinking I'm going to do the same trick. But now the judge says, when Mr. Pritchard gives evidence, he's going to be handcuffed to the dock. Right? So there's no fucking hope of getting any doc documents out of my pocket again. He's not going to let that one happen. So I think, okay, what's good for you is good for the gander. So what we now do is, magically... A website appears and it's got all the intelligence documents on it anyway so now when my co-defense is giving his evidence so he's giving his evidence he gives his evidence in chief as the prosecutor comes to him he starts to say justice and crime dot tk justice and crime dot dk judges what's he talking about he's got that's a website your honor where all the corrupt customs officers names are on right the judge is like what's his what anyway so the jury now this is a new jury anyway so the judge is like if you look up that website you're all in contempt of court stay off your laptops you're not to go in this case not to go. anyway that night miraculously a pirate radio station also reads out the, the website right anyway so now the thing's properly in the public domain. It's getting hundreds of hits. People are downloading documents. You've got a whole scenario going on. So now the judge is like, right, okay. Um, the jury want to know what the document's about. We can't show the jury these documents because it is highly prejudiced against them, right? And their public interest immunity, which is put on, put on by the Quran, right? So now the next shuffle is going to be 
what do you do? How, you know, how, how, do you, how do you stop this leakage? So he's now rewriting law as he goes along. He says, OK, we'll share the, the disclosure with the co-defendants so as no one's got an unfair balance. But of course, we already know what's on them anyway, so that's achieved absolutely nothing. But in the midst of this now, by the way, right, and back I'm thinking, I'm fucked. I'm going to get sent down now. But if I can somehow get it public that there's corruption going on, I've got an appeal possibility. Anyway, I get a phone call from my missus. She says, I've got a phone call today. It's this production company, um, McIntyre's Underworld. And uh, Donald McIntyre makes some of the worst programs for criminals. He's your, he's your nightmare. This guy jumps out on you with a camera. Do you know what I mean? Door stops you the whole lot, right? So I'm thinking, he wants to make a program because he thinks I'm going down, right? So I said, all right. I said, find out um, from him. Yeah, definitely interested, right? So he can't come and visit me because he's banned from Wandsworth because they've, he's done a documentary there about corrupt prison officers like a month before. <laughs> so they won't let him in the prison. So anyway, cameraman comes along and the producer, Michael Simkin. So they sit there. I say, look, I said, it's entwined with loads of corruption. I said... And, you know, go ahead, make the, um, the, the, the documentary. So I've got a mobile phone, so I can be in contact with you. But, you know, generally follow about day-to-day -day life, my friends, my people, do you know what I mean? They'll happily help you along. They're going to make this fucking documentary, right? So three months they're filming, while all the preparation for the courts come in, right? This has come ahead of it. Anyway, so, but in the back of their heads, I'm still going to get this massive lump of bird, and that's how it's going to end, because a bad guy can never win. That's the, how these stories have to end up. Anyway, um... As we're tailing it along now, um, I'm talking to him on a mobile phone, but I'm playing it. So when Amber, poor Amber, comes and visits me in prison, it's a bad day, it's a good day. All of a sudden, envelopes have come under the cell doors. This is what I'm telling her. So she's telling back to the camera, today, St. Mary's heaven, these envelopes have been appearing under the cell doors with incriminating evidence on customs. So all this is being captured now on camera, and it's, all this is being recorded and filmed now. When we then get to the final finale, James, and then suddenly, the, uh, as I said, the, the, the case gets to its pinnacle point, we're back to square one because we've got the, tele we've got the radio station putting out the PIIs, we've got my co-defendant spilling out the name of the website, you've got people going on now, and you've got the jury, most importantly, who are desperate to get their hands on the documents to see what's on there. And you've got the judge again telling them, they'll be in prison if they even think about going there. So it's the most maddest thing you could ever imagine, right? Anyway, we're sitting there, jury's out, so they've gone there, final verdict, I'm waiting, day one comes, day two comes, day three comes, no verdict, it's Friday, I'm thinking, fuck, they're gonna come in today, right? Anyway, everyone's sitting there, camera's outside waiting. Day three, the jury are, um, there's some altercation in a jury room. So he's sending them home because they're getting frustrated, right? So someone or two people are in there who probably don't like customs anyway, who are digging and saying, listen, this guy's telling the truth. He's telling us the truth. And the judge, right? So in my life, it's going on. So when Monday morning comes now, well, Friday I knew it was right because the prosecutor who's put his life and soul into this case, Friday night he goes, Unfortunately, I can't be here on Monday, uh, Your Honour, because I've got another case in Croydon. And I'm thinking, this is the career of your, this is the case of your life, right? There's no way you're not going to want to be here for the victory moment, because Christmas, you were out there with the BBC cameras ready to give it to me, do you know what I mean? Anyway, right, Monday morning come, I see the fucking jury come in. They was all wearing their coats, all had their hats on. Straight away, I knew these fuckers can't, they can't. There's a problem in there. They're not going to go for it anyway. When they sat down, as soon as he sat down, the judge like, have you got a verdict? Sorry, Your Honour, we're completely locked. We can't come in. Of course, it's drug trial. So it's not murder. It's a drug trial with two young juries. You're free. So he quitted us. Anyway, that was the end of that journey. And of course, poor Donald McIntyre, he's made this documentary now that you've lost this massive ending. So they had to actually turn it into more of a love story. Right, which was quite classical. Do you know what I mean? This story, this poor woman, his wife is stressed, she's struggling. Do you know what I mean? Going through this journey with him, you know, and that was another episode in my life. So, at that point, at that point, James, I thought enough is enough. That's your free pass right? to make a change. Enough is enough. I've just walked out of forty years there, right? 
and I've been the luckiest man on earth. I've gone through all the warehouse parties. I've smuggled prolific amounts of contraband all over the world. Do you know what I mean? And I've just dipped and dived and dipped and dived and dipped and dived and now I'm playing with my life. Do you know what I mean? And along this journey, I've had business partners that I've seen in Jamaica get murdered. You know, I've seen everything you could imagine happen. And I've not been shot, I've not been stabbed, I've not got a scratch on me. Okay, I've walked this walk and I've gone this road, right? And I haven't had anything happen to me, right? So I thought, that's it, turn over a new leaf. So what I fucking do? Think, why don't I write a book anyway? So, of course, I've never written a smuggler. Mm, never written a book for my life. So I think, okay, right, what do I do? I'm going to put pen to paper, this story, but I can't be bothered. So I go to a publishing cuts, listen, I've got a great story, you know, but I can't be bothered to write anything about it, but I can tell you a little bit about it. So within two minutes of speaking and leaving a message on the guy's phone, it's like Bill Campbell, he's in Scotland, funny enough, mainstream publishing. So it's like four o'clock in the afternoon, Friday afternoon. Anyway, the phone rings at nine o'clock in the evening. It's like, Mr. Pritch, I said, yeah. He said, Bill Campbell, he said, I'm in mainstream publishing. I said, okay. He said, let's get your phone message, he said. He said, this is the maddest story of the world. He said, can you meet me? I said, yeah. He said, I said, I'm in Edinburgh. I said, well, I'm not going to Edinburgh. He said, okay, I'll fly down. Anyway. I met him um, Monday morning at the Groucho Club. Straight away, we signed a book deal. It was it a game? So then the question was having a book written, and I thought, okay, right, decent advance, and um, had to find a ghostwriter. So only person I could think of was my old pal Norman Parker. He'd done twenty eight years behind the door, written some best selling crime books, Parker's Tell so and so forth. So I flew that Valencia. He put the book together in 21 days, which is the world record for doing a book. A lot of it was, you know, just fluff because obviously, you know, I took him on a whole journey of cigars and all kinds of bollocks, do you know what I mean? So the book was out there and it was there. And I thought that was it, do you know what I mean? I had it sitting there, had talk of a potential film coming from the back of it. And at this stage of my life, I thought, you know what? I've got enough money. I've got everything I need, and I've said something. I, I've, I've won, I've beat them, I've, I've succeeded. So I decided it was time now to call it a day, so I moved from the manor, bought a beautiful house in Essex, and tried to start a fresh life. My son Hayden was born, and everything was looking great, James, but it was the addiction to smuggling, the whole addiction to the criminal lifestyle, couldn't give it up, okay? And... I went to Essex with the greatest attention in the world. I wanted to set up a studio where I could actually talk the talk and get young people not involved in this lifestyle. So I built a film studio, you know, which had a restaurant in it. It had a green screen film studio, it had a recording studio, and it had aspirations to be something great. Unfortunately, one of the people who was around me, um, who I trusted, I trusted because you've got to trust someone basically, you have someone close to you. I had him as my driver for quite a while. He um, fell into some trouble with some people, and I didn't want to get too deep in it, but I agreed to give him some money. Gave him 50 grand to get him out of that, you know, issue he had, anyway. Um, Trod along as you do. I remember, forget, it was 2013. Um, he came along and said, look, you know, he feels bad about the money, he wants to stop chipping off money, blah, blah, blah. But, you know, he wants to basically, you know, get some graft to get the thing going to pay me back so I'm thinking oh, okay do I don't I want to get involved in this because I've got money I don't really need to do this now do you know what I mean right anyway I'm on a journey I think to myself okay right fuck it I'm going to do it so I do it I call it on get him some gear um, huh. little did I know he'd earlier that year he had a tenant in his ass um, fucking police kicked off the door found 60,000 pills in there and five kilos of weed in a sofa, um, which is a hidden compartment, and in which case um, the tenant got arrested, said he rented the house furnished. Um, the tenant was in prison on remand. Then a series of other events had happened. He'd picked up some gear from someone and dropped... Uh, the police were watching him. He gave over the gear to an old guy called um, uh, Mr Middleton. Uh, John Middleton, his name was. Um, as he drove off, this poor sod got arrested with half a key of gear, 
then some other people, he dropped some gear to them, they got arrested straight after. So he was effectively a police magnet, right? And my connection to him now was the prize, do you know what I mean? Because he'd been called in, obviously, at some point, and at some point I would have been the, you know, grand finale anyway. I went to um, organise the gear for him, I said to him, look, uh, it's on you now, do you know what I'm saying? So you do what you got to do, and we go from now. Anyway, the fucker said to me, um, in the morning, he needs someone to go up there with him. Now, considering the last case I'd been on was being behind over 500 kilos of cocaine in my car, right? The last thing I needed to be doing was driving behind gear. So anyway, in the end, I thought, right, I can't let the situation down, so I'll go with him. So we drive down there. It's an incredible story. I say, listen, this is the protocol. If police come, I'm going to take them off the road. I've got my Range Rover. The worst case I'm going to do is get three months of dangerous driving, right? I'm a criminal. I'm practical. I look at the ups and the downs to these things, right? And you just fucking take off. Anyway, so we turn up with a turn up, gets the thing, driving back. Hey, presto, police coming out of everywhere. So I see the police car and I think, that's it, fuck it. So I come in behind them. I take them off the road. The geezer pulls up in the fucking lay-by with six keys of gear in the back of the car. I'm like, fuck. So I'm ready to go now, but of course, now the police have come everywhere for me. So, so this is what you call payback now, James. This is where it always, every dog gets their day and this is what comes back on you. So this time around now, as I've um, tried to pull off, they come on me, arrested me, took this badge on the police station. I mean, now, then obviously, boom, there we go, you're charged. So, bang on a bus, Wandsworth. I arrive at Wandsworth Prison. As I get there, Geezer puts my name on the computer, he pauses, all of a sudden, looks up at the camera, which he's got above there. Two minutes, officer comes down, there's security. He goes, oh, Pritchard. So I oh, I remember you. Um, yeah, he said, he said, listen, he said, um, just got a call. He said, you're a category prisoner. He said, we can't keep you out. Right, I said, I'm really sorry about this, right? But you're going to the block. That's what they do with your cat A's anyway. So they've taken me to the block. Now I'm sitting down there thinking, okay, I expected it anyway. I wasn't going to fucking have that happen to you and then become a category B prisoner again. So I'm sitting obviously in there two days. Then the security come. They come and they take you to Belmarsh, so a special van that brings you there with two of their officers, one of theirs anyway. So I'm back up to Belmarsh now, in on the freeze, that's where they introduce you. And um, I'm sitting in Belmarsh, waiting for the first court appearance. So I'm thinking, okay, so now I get called to one of the places where they do the first link. First time I see my co-defendant. So um, I'm seeing him... And they're reading out the charges, but they're reading out loads more charges, like all these other people that has been nicked with him, right? So I'm thinking to myself, okay, so he's up there, and then the, the, the judge go like, so what's the situation? And he goes, yes, your honour. He said, um, he's uh, admits to being, you know, responsible for the drugs, but he's under he's been under duress. So I'm thinking, okay, well, this is a good friend here. So he's obviously going to use one of these other people that he's got these other charges with and throw the duress. So when the screen goes off, the barrister goes, what's going on? I was like, what's going on? He said, you sure he's not telling you you're under duress from you? I'm saying, that's impossible. Why would he do it? Do you know what I mean? It's no, it makes no sense. It must be one of these other things. It just will be very carefully said. Anyway, he's arranged a visit for me, but no more sight of the fella. Anyway. The next round of affairs happens now, right? Lo and behold, he turns up at Belmarsh, right? So I'm thinking, great, this is now when we can talk and work out what's going to go on. Anyway, he lands at Belmarsh. Colour story short. Um, he's like, oh, yeah, OK, yeah, of course, you know. Um, but what I'll do is I'll be responsible sort of like for, you know, for, 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 for driving, but then I'll say that you maybe get it. I'm like, what the fuck are you talking about? <laughs> it, what, what, you've got a half a dozen cases here, right? Fucking put your hands up if that's what you're going to do, right? You what? And you cut me loose. Mm -hmm. You'll be all right. Of course you'll be made all right, yeah? <laughs> anyway, I don't know this little cunt, what he's doing? Anyway, he goes back to the wing, he gets on the fucking wing, and then lo and behold, a geezer grabs him, puts him in the cell, tries to cut his throat. 
anyway, he pulls the bell. So they take him off for the thing, right? Anyway, now I'm a category of prisoner. I'm asked but one at Bell Marsh, right? They called me up. You've coded someone trying you code for it, so some sort of murder him if you've you're responsible for it right you've obviously be like so what are you talking about I said, listen i do not know who would try to do that to him right i said however you know it's a prison where it goes around sometimes things do happen or maybe he's making it up anyway so i thought all right that's not a good look because now all scrutiny is on me even worse now do you know what i mean so it's a full out so they took him now they put him on and um, on another wing, I think our spot four, and he's got to our spot four. Now, other things have happened to him. People have bung geezers turned up at the door, cleaner, pissed through the side of the door in his cell. Then he won't come out to sell for food. So they're saying, look, there's the screws of bringing the food to the door. And like, we're not a fucking hotel. You're going to come down, you're not going to eat. Anyway, eventually, they move him to Chelmsford, and they've still got him at Belmarsh. The trial happens. When we go to trial, then we have it all singing, all dancing. Do you know what I mean? Anyway, my barrister basically, well, first thing he does is he does a blind eye. This is where the book came in. He comes and says, he's a notorious smuggler. He's written a book. And that's the first thing the jury's got on their plate. Do you know what I mean? So I'm thinking, I'm fucked here. This is, because there is things like this, um, and this prejudice, what you used to be able to get away with and say you can't bring it in because it's too prejudicial. But it's saying, well, you published a book. Do you know what I mean? So it's your own doing, right? Anyway, that trial happens. When that trial happens, then suddenly um, there's another person involved in the case as well who they said was the person handed the drugs over. Um, how the things went, you know, it kind of balanced on me. I said, listen, you've got the wrong person. Do you know what I mean and stuff? Because that is not the person who handed the drugs over. And basically what it turned out was they said he was in my Jeep. They said he was in, um, in my passenger in my vehicle and had driven out. Now, I knew this guy wasn't in my vehicle, so I was waiting then for the DNA to come back because there would be no DNA in there or fingerprints. I knew that would probably be enough. But what I'd realised was the reason why they'd thrown my vehicle, um, kept onto my vehicle, and they'd let back the other guy's car because they had bugs in it, and they wanted to get the car back in circulation to see what else was being said to make more of a case on me, right? Anyway, cut long story short, when the grand finale came, the guy who they said was in my vehicle, I bounced it on the police basically and showed but basically what they were up to was they'd made a mistake and she had made a mistake. What had happened was the officer was looking, Danny, Danny Alley, she couldn't see Danny Alley. So she made him in error, thought the fellow was in my car. So when it bounced back on me, I said, no, that's not, that's, that is not a fella. That wasn't a fella even seen even near the, near, near the place. So how do you know? I said, well, the fella was six foot two and this little... Russian guy gets up out of the dock and he's about sort of five foot eight, do you know what I mean? So the jury's like in dismay. So the police hated me for that because one feds just walked and I've tricked him into that happening, right? Anyway, when the jury's come back, mate has been found guilty and me and the other fella, we put the gear on in, I think it was in May, got hung juries. So I thought, yes, one more hung jury. I've done it again, James, right? I'm going <laughs> home, right? Anyway, so... I'm thinking, great, sitting back in Belmarsh, waiting for the next date to come for call. Phone my solicitor, long time friend. I said, ah, um, when the next visit? He said, sorry, I can't talk to you, Andrew. I said, what do you mean? He said, I've been arrested. I said, what? He said, they've arrested me. Um, I said, what are you talking about? He's gone, they've arrested me. Them thing that happened back in 2004, um, they've arrested me, so I can't represent you. The first killed case. First case. I thought, what the fuck, right? Anyway, now I'm hot property. So now I'm looking to find a solicitor. Now, when you're going to get barristers and solicitors getting arrested and locked up, there ain't many law firms that want to handle you because how that thing works is there's a rule of conduct usually with police and solicitors. So they don't usually cross that line, James. But on this occasion, the gloves was off. They, anyone connected to me, they were going for it the same way they had my sister, they held her on, um, uh, on bail, they had my PA. So they just went for everything and everyone they could around me because they wanted to make an example of me. And I get it now, do you know what I mean, and stuff. You can get away with so many things for so long. Mm. Sooner or later, you're going to pay the price. Anyway, gloves was off. So they bounced me into that, search, into that square and I thought, okay, I'm fucked. Got a solicitor, done a really good job, best he could do. But of course, good and better, do you know what I mean? Anyway, got fake guilty, 
give me 15 years. I thought, okay, the sentencing guide I was seven and a half years, he's took me through the roof, right, which... I'd expected because he's now read them PII papers. Is that those the ones, little papers you said? The ones I've got in my yeah. drawer, right? So I know where that's coming from, right? So I said, okay, it's an appeal, but I'm going to be in prison for a good few years for that appeal to come. Anyway, that ain't just enough for them. So in their heads, they're thinking, right, we want to give him what he should have got in the first place. So they're calculating how they're going to get this sentence up. So they come with a nice hefty confiscation order, right? Which would have good me another eight years on top of that if I didn't pay it. But luckily I had money, I paid it, right? How much? Over one million pounds. I won't say the exact figure, right? Anyway, so I thought, you know what? That's deliverable, right? Anyway, now we come with a final finale, right? So we've got two serious crime, not serious crime, anti-corruption police coming to see me. So now they rock up. I'm like, what the fuck now, right? So they've gone, right, when you was arrested, there were these files found in your room, in your uh, in your house, and they're from so-and-so papers and all that. My solicitor's dresses is everything in himself. Oh, my God, not more things now. Anyway, they've gone, um, and there's like so-and-so, so-and-so. So I'm looking, and I'm thinking to myself, are you fucking real here? Anyway, then they started to go on, and they started to say, there's this one's fingerprints, that one's finger, that one. And I'm thinking, this is fucking bad, because there are people's fingerprints on this. There's a whole other conspiracy case going on. Then, I get the next bit, they show me a picture of my mate. And I'm like, what the fuck? From a video thing. They goes, this man faxed these documents to the court on such and such a day, blah, blah, blah. This was on Crime Watch, because I remember it coming on Crime Watch. Because when I got not guilty, I went off to Mexico. I was down in Mexico for like about three or four weeks. And someone, when I called back, said, listen, fucking your pals all over the telly. He's been on Crime Watch. They said he's perverted the course of justice, 100 million pound drug case, right? So I was thinking, anyway, when's it going to come? Anyway, so I cut long story short, right? The weirdest thing happened at the end of it. They goes, after doing all that routine, they goes... He said you had nothing to do with it, and he's admitted to doing it. And I'm thinking, what the fuck would you come down here, get me out of my cell, question me about this, and then say that he's admitted it and said I had nothing to do with it? It defeats the whole object of an investigation, right? So I'm scratching my head thinking, there's fucking got more to this than that anyway, right? So I'm thinking, I've got this hanging over my head, because they can come at any time and go and land me again with another charge, which they tend to do towards the end of your sentence when you're coming home. I've known loads of people, they just spring something new on you. So it anyway, doesn't run concurrent? Always, right? Mm-hmm. Anyway, thinking, all right, fuck this. So I'm sitting in my thing, and this time I'm putting my head in different spaces. And I'm watching what's going on in the system. I'm watching lots of kids battering each other because of this whole postcode gang thing. And I'm seeing, and things are absorbing slowly but surely with me, James, all right? This is where a change is actually coming, believe it or not, right? And I'm seeing young kids that I know, their parents, their grandparents, you know what I mean? Good people. And these kids are wrapped up in this postcode gang thing and they're killing each other. And they're all there doing 36-year wrecks and they all do all these mad things. So I thought to myself... Someone's got to think about it, because the prison, the system's not doing anything about it. Anyway, another uh, friend of mine, um, he was inside as well. Um, I don't think he must say it's Clifford Hobbs, Mumbles we call him. You know, he um, was a double-A cat. He came down to double-A, but to single-A. And again, he's a mature man. And it was like, you're right, you know, at the end of the day, <laughs> we're both fake cats. Let's think about something we can do positive to bring ourselves off of the book. But also, let's see if we can make a change. So... We got in the air with the governor, basically, constantly, to say for custody governor, because I was a listener all the time. I said, look, there's a solution to this problem. You know, there's good kids out there who are doing big sentences that really now are tired of this, right? Let's give them some mentoring skills. Let's get them working in a capacity. When the kids come through the, the reception, first thing they said, oh, they're part of a gang, they turn around and say, no, they're not part of a gang because they're going to get more, more bird if they do. So let's airmark them. Let's say, look, we know you're part of the gang. We know you're part of this thing. We'll sit you on a different wing, right? We'll get mediation going between, you know, two of the main guys from those areas, and we'll park it up, right? Anyway, eventually she agreed to do it. She's got eight good mentors, eight guys who knew the gang thing inside out. We brought them in, we trained them, and then basically it was introduced into the prison. It's called One Postcode. 
And what happened was massive reductions in the assaults. And then, of course, it means officers ain't got to be walking around free-handed from A to B every single wing with the inmate. You know, people visits ain't going to get turfed at because there's a fight and the bell goes. You're not going to be constantly banged up. And then it was a cycle. And I realised, actually, I'm doing some good stuff here now. Good stuff is starting to work and starting to happen. Anyway, so I started with that. But then, of course... The corruption thing now is still balancing on me. So I think, okay, let me see now what the next um, part of my journey is going to be. So I'm thinking, right, I've got to find out why they've said that. Why have they said that to him? Why have they said, you know, he's took the blame for me? So anyway, I then, because he's in prison as well at the time as well with a different charge. So anyway, so I send a message now to see what's going on. Anyway, what happens... What has happened is a whole tier of worms has been opened. It turned out the officer, the main officer, who was involved in the corruption, he has basically been arrested, right? And when he's now been arrested, he's obviously opened a tin of worms on all his colleagues. But what's happened is you've got a brand new unit form called NCA, because they only formed in 2013. And the officers who now, they've been working, because when people do things, you can never do one thing on your own. It always takes more than one person, a little team of you, to make things happen, right? So what's happened is, over the years, he's had a whole little network that he's grafted with, right? So when he now is going to face 25 years or 15 years for tippling my case up, he's now bubbled up all his colleagues. But the damage that now would have caused, right, on the system, because every single person that's been nicked, by that squad, every single penny they've taken off people in terms of confiscation orders, take the system down. Everyone's going to appeal their conviction. Everyone's going to have to get their compensation money paid back to them with interest. It's a fucking tin of worms like you couldn't believe. So I thought, okay, we're going to play the game. Let's play the game. I've got an appeal coming up, right? And I'm going to bring the conviction down on myself anyway. My sister goes like, shit. I said, no, I want to get rid of it. I said, I know the game. I know what's happened, right? They can't do it. They cannot prosecute me for this, right? Because it's got to be kept a lid on, right? Anyway, so lo and behold, right, I bring it down. I say, right, okay, I'm prepared to admit the whole fucking lot, right? I paid off corrupt officers, right? And they they helped me destroy my case, right? And I'll take it to the bank. We'll go all the way with it. Anyway. At the corruption police are like, yeah, 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 this is a big case, this is a big... but they're all guessing it because they can't go nowhere, right? Anyway, so I'm sitting there balancing it now. They dragged me now for a year and a half. This grand finale was going to come, it was going to come anyway. When it comes to the death of it now, he's got a um, court date's been set, which of course I knew was never going to happen. When it arrived, then I got the thing I showed it to, it's hilarious. So he's gone to me. You're going to be sentenced, he said, but no one else is going to be charged. I said, what? He said, they're not going to charge anyone else. He said, um, I said, it's a conspiracy. So how can I be a one-man conspirator myself unless I conspired in the mirror? He said, Andrew, it is what it is. He said, the reality is you're the only person to be charged for it. They want it to go, you just go away quietly, right, okay, and basically that will be the end of it anyway. I went up there, thinking it's lovely, with Suffolk Crane Court, with Suffolk. So I arrived there, and they're talking, you know, obviously Mr. Pritchard brought this down on himself, blah, 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 blah. Mm. So I thought, okay, right, now, where's he going to go with this? So it's looking good. So when I go back round, the, um, the, the warden says to me, oh, just prevent the course of justice. That's like a suspended sentence, do you know what I mean? And I'm thinking, like, suspended sentence, is it fuck? Do you know what I mean? So when I've gone back up there now, I've got um, Judge Griffiths, he's come back up there, he's gone. Never in my life have I seen such a terrible case, he said, of perverted a course of justice. He's gone, um, you know, he said, you were, uh, a half a metric tonne of cocaine was imported, had you been found guilty of that? This would happen. Anyway, he's rolling off this big, long fucking speech, and I'm thinking, fuck, this guy's going to give this to me. I'm doing a 15, and I'm going to get hit with another fucking sentence now, right? Anyway... I thought, Jesus, anyway, so when he's rolled up on me now then, finally he's banged me down and he's given me another three. So I'm thinking, I'm fucked. I've got 18 years, right? Okay. But still, I'm hanging in the ballot. I've got my pill coming in anyway. 
So I was going back to that show that night, thinking to myself, oh, fuck, I've given myself another three years for no good reason there, James, right? Anyway, I sat it out, went back to the Court of Appeal and stuff. Anyway, I was optimistic for Court of Appeal. Anyway, they came down eventually, and I got down to ten and a half years. So then I thought, all right, so I'm now in a position that I'm going to do five and a half, six years, and I'll get my freedom back, providing I don't fuck up anything else. And then the greatest day of my life came, and I thought, because I was sitting it through, I was an A cat, a B cat, and then they turned and said, eventually, you know, you've got your D cat. And my parents were very old at the time, and I always thought in the back of my head, they're going to die, right? And I'm going to be in prison when they die. I knew if they were in prison when, if I, if I was in jail when they died, James, there would be no such thing as rehabilitation for me, and there would be pure anger, right? And I'll never forget, um, I got my first home leave, and uh, I saw my mum. She had dementia. She was a shell of a person. My dad, you know, dementia was getting to him early stages. Um, you know, Amber, you know, she'd been through all this shit. My son was, had grown, do you know what I mean? And um, I just looked at it and thought to myself, this is what prison's about, do you know what I mean? This is what my fucking life was about. All the people I loved, I've effectively destroyed playing this fucking game. Do you know what I mean? Anyway, um, when I did get released, I thought to myself, I've got to do something positive now in my life, James. And I set about creating a foundation. And I thought to myself, all the problems I made as a young man, the mistakes I made, all this drug smuggling that I thought was great and prolific, it's an illness, it's an addiction, it's a sickness, right? I wanted to create courses that people could you know, learn from these mistakes. Do you know what I mean? Understand, you haven't got to sell drugs to be successful. You know, had I stayed to be a promoter, I would have been far more successful, made far much, much more money, right? And been able to make people proud of me, what I'd done. So the foundation for me was all about setting it up, giving kids opportunities into music, film, you know, all the artistic stuff that kids do like, but don't have you in there. Give them support, teach them the signals and the signs that we've got. Do you know what I mean? We look at it and think it's so glamorous to go down that road. It's so great, you know, all the money, all the drugs, all the women. At the end of it, the price you're going to pay, right, is not a price to anyone. I wouldn't wish it on my worst enemy. Do you know what I mean? Because we spoke earlier about the films, Scarface, everybody knows the famous lines, this and that, but everybody forgets that. Everyone forgets it. was actually it. blasted at the end and shot. Everyone and forgets You look it. at the films, Blow, you look at El Chapo, you look at, um, who's the, the Colombian? Um, uh, Colombian? The guy. Oh, Escobar. 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 Escobar dead, El Chapo, kept her skating, kept getting caught. You, well, even yourself, you're like an evil genius. It's like, you've always got, an avenue how to try and beat the system but it always beats you doesn't it every single time especially the misery and the pain not just the people who's took drugs and died yeah. it's also the misery and pain your mum and dad seeing you in prison at courts broken down relationships probably not get special bonds with your kids is the way you should have what do you think looking back at it all looking back at it all um the there's two things that i look back at number one you're never going to beat the system okay and yeah there's corruption in the system not saying it's completely corrupt, but there are people, elements in there that people like me have managed to get to, okay? So that's a small part of the system, but the system is always gonna win because that is the system that's there to win. Now, the minute we think that we're bigger than the system, okay, and I thought I was bigger than the system, okay, then you made the biggest mistake you could ever make because it will come and bite you in the arse. And it might not be that case, but it will come. It will come down the line. And to be quite honest to you, I'm still the luckiest man in the world here because I'm here. I could easily be still sitting right. in Whitemore Prison, you know, where I was sitting, yeah, you know, right in a way. and right in a way. And I've got friends and people, great examples, Curtis Warren. You know, Curtis is a guy who spent so many years in prison, okay, right? And, you know, it's a question of the system hates him, okay? And when the system hates you, this is what they do, they push you. They push you, they push you, they push you, right? And the minute they get you in that corner, the cases will keep coming, you know? The, it, it, they won't stop, you know? And that's just one example. There's at least a dozen examples I can give you of people who, you know, I know over the years who have had amazing runs. I mean, and geniuses. Oh, I've worked the system and I've, you know, I've been very smart in certain elements, you know? I've looked for the holes, I've looked for the gaps, and I've punched them, I've pulled the triggers. 
people far smarter than me and they're still getting 26 years. They're still getting 18 years. They're still getting big sentences. They're not happening when they're 20 years old or 25 years old, James. They're happening when they're 50 years old. So what does it break it all down to, greed, power? What do you break it all down? Because many times you try to come home, try to change your life and get sucked straight back in when you could have retired hundred times yeah. over. So what does it all come down to? When you break it all down, these people are doing life and they're worth 100 yeah. million, 200 yeah. million. What does it all come down to? It's a combination of stupidity, greed and selfishness. Okay? Because if you're selfish, to do it to people that we love, okay? We're greedy because we're happy with what we got. We always want more. And we're stupid because we think we're going to get away with it. You know, yeah. and those are three things. And how's Curtis? Is he getting out? Do you speak to him? I've Curtis is due at 2023, you know. And uh, another, an example of someone, because his case is just weaved with corruption. I think he gave me his papers there, you know. I mean, they had bugs in a car, okay, and the car travelled from France to England. There was no authorization for that. In any court of law, they're illegal bugs, and that's what the case is built on. But the reality is... And I've seen it with my own eyes, and it states in there, it's crystal clear, the end justifies the means. This is the Attorney General's jersey. That's what they've said, end justifies the means. Police have physically said, yeah, we broke the law to get him. When you've got a situation like that and the, 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 the cards are weighed against you, it just lets you know, doesn't it? Mm -hmm. And Kurtz is one example. You know, there's at least at least six more people I know in prison right now. And the reason why they're there isn't necessarily because of what they've been caught for here, do you know what I mean, or what the police have done. It's because of the hatred that they built up with the police over the years and the system over the years, you know? Yeah, and that goes to show for anybody watching that if you're if the coppers want you, they'll get you. No matter, like, there's, like you said there, there's not people they've been caught with, but it's the... The years and years of the backlash it's, of the shit that you've done. You're gonna pay. You're yeah. gonna pay that price. You know, you'll pay that price. And the misery that it brings, as I said. How hard does it get really out? How is it now to you talk about that life? Where do you think do you go, I miss it or you know what? No, I'm sick of it. Yeah. Because you know what? Tired um, of it. And to be honest to you, right, it's something where as an example, when the bourbon smuggler book um is in circulation. I um because you know, that's a real situation. That ego project, basically, the vanity project in that book, was my downfall. You know, and uh, in 2017, I bought the rights back from the publisher, and um, I decided, in fact, two weeks ago, I was going to release it. But I'm going to release it, and every single royalty, every single penny, goes to the charity. You know, it's going to go in a specific series of courses for young people to stop getting involved in selling drugs. Do you know what I mean? Because Where can people buy this book? You can, you'll be able to buy it on Amazon. Um, you know, um, it'll be yeah, it'll be available for Amazon. So your plan is to give back, help people, build lives up instead of destroy? Uh, the destruction I've caused over the years, okay, I'm going to be paying that back for the rest of my life, okay? Because the story you heard about my parents, they were community leaders and they done everything to help their community. I done everything that virtually destroyed it. Do you see what I mean? What I ploughed in was all negative. When I thought it was great, the parties and all that, parties were fun. But how much drag, How many people have got still ongoing drug issues because of those events? You know, all the things I've done, I've looked at them and what do I amount to? You know, I will be classified as an incredibly successful criminal. That is how stupid this world is, you know. And anyone that can do that, anyone that can put their mind and think, yeah, I want to do that, I want to reach that reach that goal you know just look at some of them PII papers you want to see people that are your friends or informants do you want to see police surveillance stuff they even create about it doesn't even exist isn't even true but in order to get more funding to continue more surveillance you know it's like what would you want to live that life for it's constant and then you've got a situation where people think you've got more than them and then people want to set you up to get you robbed people want to get you killed which means then you are going to get people killed this is something that, at the end of the day, is not a life that's fit for anyone. Yeah, you know? it's just a non-stop car crash. And it will never stop. Yeah, but your plan is now, going forward for the future, is to help the youth create that's positivity. All I can do, all I can do is use the AP Foundation as a vehicle that can, you know, be a positive vehicle to help people, okay? Help kids who 
need help you know help anyone that needs help really because you know there are 40 year old men that need help there are 40 year old women that need help Mm -hmm. you know not just like 16 or 17 year old kids more so than because they're being groomed and because they're being sold a dream which is a nightmare yeah you know see the bit i'm jumping back in time here the bit with carlton leach and he takes ecstasy is that one of your raves or was that that was my party yeah so that was was colton and that was colton's first time you ever took his you know (laughs) and yeah first day that was the first day proper naughty tough bastard that back in the day colton yeah proper and that was an amazing door we had you know because we had 12 of the strongest doormen in east london you know Mm -hmm. and i said and colton and you see colton now you know an example of colton colton's a guy with a good heart do you know what I mean? Mm-hmm. And people see how well, Colton's got a side to him, obviously, you know, like all the other guys did. But, you know, you're talking about people, if they had your back, they had your back, well, you know, yeah. all the way, you know, all the way, mm-hmm. you know. And the thing is, that's the thing sometimes. And Colton, he's had his journey, you know, as I said. And Colton's a very lucky man to be alive. Yeah. You know, that's what he said. He's got Colton his re- now and doing his thing. And yeah, I've got a lot of time for Colton. Colton could have been in that Range Rover that night, believe me. That's scary. Yeah. You know. What do you think now, looking back in your life? Looking back at my life, for the first time in my life now, I think all that, that journey and all that stuff, I can actually use it now in a positive way, you know, because I can have something to say. If someone says to me, turns and says to me, well, you know, I want to get involved in this life, I want to get involved in this, I'll just say to them straight, you're probably not even going to get close, anywhere near close to where you think you want to go without getting either dead, shot, stabbed, in prison, these are the most obvious options because I had a great formula working for me. The pieces fell into place really easily. But do you know how many people I know who are business associates and partners that were shot down dead, you know, all because people were trying to get in front of them in a ladder, do you know what I mean? Or there was a minor dispute, but usually more often than not, people don't want progress. If you're progressing, someone sees that's a spot they want to they hold because it should be them progressing. And that's the mind of a smuggler. That's the mind of a criminal. You know, criminals have this... Someone told me years ago, the worst thing you could do is be a successful criminal. Everyone's going to want to call you a grass. Everyone's going to call you uh, no good. Everyone's going to call everything bad about you. Everyone's going to steal what you've got. Everyone's going to want what you've got. But the rally is, what would you want to be in a business like that it's not like you're going to go in an office or you're going to go into a business. You're going to, go, you're going to get you know, amended for what you do and you're going to go and you're going to get you know, credit for that. All you're going to get is heat from the police, jealousy from your friends and you know, chaos from your family because how can they operate when you're doing all that? Yeah, mm. It's funny, man. You, you speak to people and they think they're big ballers but then you actually hear your story you realise, fuck me, man, people are well off the pace. James, this... I, I, it saddens me because people are living on names and living on ego and they haven't even touched the surface. But when you go there and you've been there and you sat with the highest you could go and been that person, you realise it's still nothing. It amounts to nothing. Do you see what I mean? It amounts to nothing. All it amounts to is death, destruction and misery. That's all we're creating. You know? yeah. For anybody watching that's maybe in a life of crime or thinking about getting, getting into it, what advice would you give for them? The advice I can say is this. Depends how old you are. If you're a wrong person, you know, the best thing you can do, and that's the old cliche, study. Study. Education. You know, you can make more as a computer programmer or doing something in a creative arts industry or having a business, setting up a business, okay, and having success, far more than you can ever have with this. And sustain money, you know, you'll leave something for your kids, you'll have a legacy, you'll build things legitimately. All you build here is something which is going to be a house of cards because when it goes wrong, the police come and take it all anyway. Yeah. Looking back on it all, final question, would you change anything? Would I change anything? And that's a real funny question because would I change the life I've lived, all the stuff I've put into it and all the stuff I've experienced? No, because it's my life. It's my story. Would I change the misery that I've caused my family, friends and death and destruction to all the people I had as a result of doing what I'd done? Of course I would change all that. But one has to go with the other. So what can I do? Balance it. Try to put back some good for some of the negative that I've created. Mm-hmm. And that's it, James. Exactly. You know? Andrew. Thank you. Absolutely phenomenal Thank you. story. Thank you. Can't wait to see the rest of your journey and what you do for the future and the kids. And it's going to be powerful. And I can't wait to see you, brother. You've got my backing. 
And if you want to travel to the website, it's um, www.apfoundation.co.uk. All the courses we do are there. You know, we do online courses. People can come on board. They can apply for those. You know, we supply those free, you know. And if you want help, if you want a way out, we have a five-step pathway, intervention to get into the communities, rehabilitation to get into the prisons, you know, employment, housing, training. You know, we offer all those things, James, you know, and it's not just lip service, you know. One thing about me is I'm real. If I say it, I do it, and it's what we do, you know. We can leave the links in the description for that because that'll be some powerful stuff. But Brilliant. Thanks for coming on Thank today, you, brother, James. God Thank bless. you. Check out more of my podcasts on the right and be sure to like, share and comment your thoughts on this week's podcast. Thank you.